Good afternoon, everybody. It is my great honor and pleasure and privilege uh, to organize this uh, very first uh, European Association of Neurological Surgeons uh, section for peripheral neurosurgery web educational webinar. This is, uh, in, let's say, an inaugurational uh, webinar in starting a series of uh, ENS webinars, educational webinars. Uh, in the future uh, in uh, different topics, in different fields of uh, neurosurgery. I would like to express my uh, gratitude to the ENS for giving us opportunity to share our experience uh, within uh, the very special field of peripheral neurosurgery, which is, uh, as you know, the name of the, of the webinar. The peripheral nerves still a neurosurgical pathology. You will hear that uh, peripheral neurosurgery is an uh, essential part of neurosurgery, and you will hear, you will hear the updates in uh, neurosurgery according to the worldwide um, current trends in uh, peripheral neurosurgery. You have opportunity to hear uh, distinguished uh, neurosurgeons, all neurosurgeons who are members of the ENS section of peripheral neurosurgery, and uh, our honorary member, from uh, Argentina, uh, Professor Mariano Sokolowski, who is uh, practically a European, uh, Argentinian European. But uh, you see the names, you saw the program. In order to be on time, I would kindly like to draw your attention to follow the schedule and uh, to the time to timeline. And uh, there will be a lot of opportunities for questions and answers. My particular pleasure is that we are already full in, uh, within the registration. Uh, 100 people already make a registration. So according to the, this uh, option, uh, all other people who are interested in uh, different channels through the social media within the website of European Association of Neuro Neurological Surgeons is open now for communication and to for listening. So the webinar is recording. It will be also, there will be also possibility to uh, check the webinar and to listen everything uh, after the webinar on the social channels and uh, social media. Thank you everybody. Thank you friends from, uh, colleagues and friends from uh, section for, for peripheral neurosurgery. European section for peripheral neurosurgery for doing a great job and uh, making this webinar very efficient, very uh, practical and very uh, attractive to the audience. In order to be uh, practical, I will now give the floor to the Professor Stefano Ferraresi who created this webinar and uh, he will say a few words, then will we go according to the schedule, we, what we received, what everybody received already. Thank you once again, Stefano, please. Good evening to everybody. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to prepare this webinar. And the issue is a very important issue because uh, as you know, as colleagues in neurosurgery, uh, you feel probably a little bit apart from the true neurosurgery, especially in the Congresses. The point is whether peripheral nerve surgery should be done by a neurosurgeon. Is, it the, is he or she the ideal person or should leave this task for the orthopedic or plastic surgeon? This is a big issue. My opinion is that surgery pertains to those who are able to do it. So I do not distinguish between the specialties. However, each specialty has a peculiarity which gives some advantage and some disadvantage facing the complex field of peripheral nerves. Um, the first part of the meeting would be dedicated to what happens or what happened in the past in our countries and some of you will speak about their experience. And then we will hear people thinking, or thinking because charged by me, that the neurosurgeon is better than the other specialist. 
and other people uh, seeing the cons part, the, uh, the disadvantage of being neurosurgeon. So I can give you, because I've lost the program, I was looking in my phone, but I didn't find, so I give uh, the word to Lucas, who has the exact order of the program. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Stefano. Let's move uh, five minutes presentation, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Esa Natalia Denisova from Novosibirsk, Russia, how it used to be in our countries, concretely in Russia. Please keep on the uh, uh, timetable, and then we go for with Stefano, Ferraresi, Italy, then I will say a few words, and then uh, Rabin from Nepal will say also five minutes presentation. Then we go, we move on. Natalia, please. Uh, turn on your microphone, please, Natalia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's okay. Now you can. It's okay. Okay, good. So, good evening, dear ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen. Um, my name is Natalia Denisova, and I'm a neurosurgeon from Russia. Uh, so, uh, my presentation is about situation in Russia concerning peripheral nerve surgery. So, first of all, I would like to say, uh, about my hospital and uh, my city. So here is the map of Russia and the city Novosibirsk is situated almost in the center of it. And I work in neurosurgical center, which has five departments and 100 beds. And we do uh, more than 200 nerve surgeries each year, but we don't have any emergent care. Uh, so when uh, Professor Ferraresi invited me to participate in this webinar, uh, I tried to find some information concerning nerve surgery in our country. And actually annually about four to 7,000 patients in Russia need surgical treatment of peripheral nerve pathology. And only 3,000 of patients are operated by neurosurgeons and rest patients are operated by orthopedic surgeons, hand surgeons, plastic surgeons, and then other surgeons, for example, general or vascular. And in, it happens more, um, especially in some small towns or really far away regions. And there are still, unfortunately, some percent of patients which uh, never get any qualified medical care or they apply to neurosurgeons too late and already cannot get uh, necessary medical help. Uh, so uh, uh, there are some facts, actually interesting facts that uh, about 80 to 90% of patients with nerve injuries in emergency period are operated by orthopedic and hand surgeons. Very rare by vascular, of course, if they need uh, vascular surgery. And questioning of surgeons working in emergency revealed that only 50% of doctors are ready to perform peripheral nerve suture in emergency. So that, mean that, uh, that means that they have uh, enough skills to, to diagnose this nerve injury, to find this nerve in the wound, and they have uh, necessary equipment to perform nerve suture, for example, microscope or suturing materials. So what happens then? And after the first aid, which is actually very often just skin suturing, nerve repair is left um, on the patients themselves or uh, on neurologists. So, and very often this problem postponed uh, indefinitely. And in later period, nerves are operated mostly by neurosurgeons and plastic surgeons but still quite rare. Tunnel syndromes are operated by everybody. So neurosurgeons mostly, hand surgeons, of course. Uh, I have to say that hand surgeons in Russia, they have uh, 
the same education as orthopedic surgeons, and they have the same uh, experience, and uh, so they, they come from, from orthopedics and plastic surgeons. So there are some uh, popular surgeons in the country, including orthopedic and plastic surgeons, who has extensive experience in peripheral nerve surgeries, and they have good reputation, and so uh, thus they have large flow of patients. And I agree with uh, Professor Ferrez is that uh, peripheral nerves are done by surgeons who can do this, so who just enthusiastic to do this. And in conclusion, I would like to say that peripheral nerve surgery is still a neurosurgical practice in Russia, but we need more collaboration between different specialists, especially uh, during emergency period to get, uh, to get better results and to improve our treatment. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Natalia. Excellent presentation. Uh, we will comment that uh, later on when we finish our presentation. So I would like I will invite now Professor Stefano Ferrezi to share his screen and uh, to tell us uh, in five minutes uh, his uh, experience uh, in Italy and worldwide how it used to be. Can you? It's okay. Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, my second place where I work it. And I, I start with a tribute to my uh, second chief. You probably recognize Professor Cassinari. If you uh, recall the neurosurgical experience, you know that the tentorial meningioma are fed by the Bernasconi Cassinari artery. This is the man. And on the left, there is a very young Dr. Stefano Ferraresi staring at the ceiling. And uh, I remember this day because uh, I was back uh, from Vienna, from Milesi, from Lausanne, Naracas. I saw many plexus. Each week uh, I went to uh, Lausanne to see the plexus, to speak with Professor Naracas. And that day uh, I, I told my chief, Professor Cassinari, I'm ready. Tomorrow I can start with my first plexus. And he told me, uh, Stefano, remember that I cannot help you. I don't understand anything. But if you're ready, go. So I went and this was the start. Was He trusted me and this I am grateful to him because it is very rare that the chief trusts you on one thing that he is not able to do. Uh, so I'm grateful to him for this. The second uh, tribute is to Mark May. Uh, Mark May uh, worked at the Shadyside Hospital in Pittsburgh. This is uh, his dedication to me, to Stefano, you, you brought me good luck because when I arrived there, he had a six nerve palsy from diabetes probably. And after uh, one month that I was there, uh, he recovered. So he's writing here, I had double vision, end of my surgical career, and now you brought me luck. So uh, I owe to uh, Professor May all my knowledge on the facial nerve. And uh, he devised, as you, can, as you probably remember, he devised the technique of jump graft that for many, many years has been the leading technique in using the hypoglossal fascial reinnervation. And then we went on with the masseter, with the intrapetrous uh, translocation, but the big merit was of, of uh, Professor Mark May. This is a big a giant. He was uh, thought to be, uh, to deserve the Nobel Prize because he was able to make some paraplegic walk with the, the technique of reinnervation from the cervical for the dorsal spinal cord directly to the femoral nerve. It was a giant, was an orthopedic surgery, and uh, uh, it was my teacher. And then uh, we became very close friends. Also, 
our wives became friends. And now, uh, last year, he passed away, but he was really a giant, uh, probably a, a very nice person, high level, cultural. He wrote of uh, uh, Roman history of uh, Etrurian, and he was a multiform, ingenious professor. You know, here he is alive, Professor Gilbert. I owe to him the dedication to obstetrical palsies, which is a very fascinating field with many, many discussion. I was in Paris many, many years ago and we operated together. It was uh, the first foreign people paying me for a surgery. I did a reconstruction of the lumbar plexus in his clinic. He was not able to expose the, the spinal cord and the lumbar cord. So uh, uh, I, he wanted me to help him and then in turn, I stayed with him, visiting the obstetrical palsies, the babies, and I always learned a lot from him. Then the other is a big contribution, he is a plastic surgeon, Ezio Morelli, which passed, he passed away uh, many years ago now. And now my friend, Piero Raimondi, who was the first pupil of Professor Morelli, is a big friend, a big uh, surgeon, uh, very intelligent, very nice, very uh, always helps when you have a problem. We are really very close. He's like a, um, he's like a um, major brother for me. And I learned a lot of things from him in uh, concerning orthopedic, uh, plastic or hand surgery. Then uh, I dedicated also to the surgery for neuropathic pain, to the microdrisotomy, and then uh, I owe uh, to Mark Sindhu uh, the full understanding of what is this surgery. I was in Lyon in 1997, and I also respect him as a big master for me, and I'm grateful also to Mark Sindhu. He's a neurosurgeon, and the other were orthopedic and plastic surgeons. Hanno Milesi, I was in 87, now he's passed away, unfortunately. This is the Wien old polyclinic. This is the statue of Billroth, the surgeon of the um, vagal vagotomy of technique of Billroth for a stomach ulcer. And Hanno Milesi gave to me the the knowledge that no tension must be at the suture line. Nowadays, for us, it is obvious. But I remember very well in that years, I spent time in his laboratory when, uh, where he was cutting the nerves with neuroma and seeing that in all the cases that had tension, there was a lot of proliferation of Schwann cells and no axons passing. So we have learned now to put graphs. This was the very important contribution of Hanno. He was not the first one of using graphs, but he mm, propelled, he encouraged people using graphs and not making tension under suture. Then neurosurgeon, Professor Klein, you see in New Orleans, I was in, so I, I, I visited all the big masters of the years in the 90s. This was in New Orleans. This is a nice picture of his, always it had something to do in the time. Now, uh, nowadays I saw in, uh, in Belgrade, he's in good health, although of course it is uh, older as, all, as we all. And uh, he's a very nice, uh, nice man and good teacher. And I learned from him, uh, not much the registration, the nap, because I don't use anymore, it is not useful. But I learned from him the posterior approach, which is also very difficult to do and very rare to do in the brachial plexus, but how to perform fully a thoracic outlet. He was a very fan of the thoracic outlet with full exposure of subclavian, artery, vein, C8, and T1. There are still, there are many people making fake thoracic outlets. They cut a little bit of flesh of the scalene anterior, see the C5, C6, and they pretend, and they say they have done the surgery. In this case, the thoracic outlet syndrome is not cured. So he was for me a big uh, contribution, a big master, a big teacher concerning this particular 
kind of surgery. This is a nice picture. I was younger, as you can see, but still with very few hair. And we were in, in Washington at the American Congress of Neurosurgery. This is Lincoln Memorial. And this is a very nice picture that I love because I'm very happy with this. And this one is what I is uh, the man I consider my best teacher. It is, uh, uh, this is a picture of the uh, congresses he organized in Lausanne. And I remind you the next uh, Naracas Congress in Berlin, 2021. It was uh, fantastic. I went to him every week, one or two days a week when I uh, finished my duty on the ward. I was very sleepy. I took the train. I went to Lausanne. At that time, I lived in Milan, so there were three hours. And then I arrived in the evening in Lausanne, and the morning after, we went to surgery. And what he's doing here uh, on the blackboard, you can see, he did with the pen in the paper of the gloves. So he stopped at surgery. He opened the paper containing the gloves and with the pen was drawing and writing what he was doing, why, what are the drawbacks, uh, simulating the reconstruction, and he was a great master. Unfortunately, he passed away too early. It was 63 by a pancreas uh, carcinoma. Uh, this, with this, uh, who is the man uh, which, uh, who I, uh, think is my real master in brachial plexus surgery, I want to terminate my speech. Thank you very much for attention. I finish with the oath of Hippocrates who says that you have to reckon your masters, the people who teach this art of medicine, equally dear as my parents. And I can assure you that with due proportion, at the time when Naracas passed away, it was like if I had lost my father. This is truly, it was the sensation. Because for two years, I saw him every week, every week, and so 50 times a year. And it was for me really a great loss. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Stefano, for this excellent overview. This is a not only overview uh, of, uh, uh, how it used to be in Italy, but how it used to be worldwide. Uh, we will have a possibility to, to screen, uh, to comment uh, that uh, also at the end. Uh, now I will uh, share my screen to say some words about um, how it's in uh, Serbia. I hope you are seeing my screen, right? Okay, uh, this is uh, just uh, the referral nerve system surgery, how it used to be in Serbia. This is a, a short overview of uh, past 10 years, uh, not going uh, very back uh, long uh, in a history, but uh, this is uh, something which uh, we, always arguing uh, why neurosurgeons are not doing peripheral neurosurgery. Is the peripheral neurosurgery as important as clipping an aneurysm or resecting a brain tumor or uh, spine stability? This is the famous uh, communication between uh, Mariano and myself uh, during uh, all these years uh, when we keep on rolling together uh, worldwide in uh, promotion, promoting peripheral neurosurgery to be as an equal part of uh, neurosurgery like other, other uh, subspecialties in neurosurgery. So why are then surgeons of other specialties doing peripheral neurosurgery? Is it only because neurosurgeons are avoiding or is, is it uh, because uh, it should be like that or we should do it in something like uh, doing uh, nerve surgery as a subspeciality, sub following some further education after the basic Subspecialization. Some short overview on, in the neurosurgical, orthopedic, and plastic surgery, surgery department in Serbia from 2011 to 2020. How much uh, cases, uh, different 
types of entities of uh, peripheral nerve uh, pathology uh, were operated in uh, different departments. This is a small depart of, I mean, clinical center of uh, Kragujevac, clinic for neurosurgery in Kragujevac. This is, a, let's say, a, for 10 years, a rather small number of, uh, of cases, but uh, this is what they have been operated, uh, just uh, like an entity without any other uh, statistical or uh, any other information. This is a military medical academy clinic for plastic and reconstructive surgery. So they uh, perform um, also mostly entrapment syndromes, uh, some, some number of uh, peripheral nerve injuries and tumors, but uh, also in Kragujevac neurosurgical department and in uh, military medical academy in Berlin, there was no plexus uh, surgery and plastic surgery. The military medical academy, but clinic for neurosurgery. There are uh, also a lot of entrapment syndromes, uh, uh, peripheral nerve injuries, uh, tumors, and some plexus surgeries in these 10 year periods. This is another city in uh, Serbia. This is a uh, Novi Sad clinical center of uh, Vojvodina, clinic for neurosurgery. For a 10 year period, they operated. Uh, also, a uh, vast majority of um, entities of peripheral nerve surgery, but in a small number without plexus surgery. And then uh, another reference center, neurosurgical center in near South Serbia, also small number of uh, peripheral nerve surgery, surgeries uh, until, uh, within the, those 10 years. Then uh, another neurosurgical department in Belgrade, also with a small number of uh, mostly entrapment syndromes. Then we have a uh, orthopedic surgery, microsurgery, emergency center, uh, clinical center of Serbia. This is usually primary reconstruction of the, of the nerves and uh, uh, primary reconstruction, not only isolated nerve injuries, but uh, also associated with another injuries like a bone and tendons and uh, uh, also including replantations but also including with vascular injuries. But this is a, uh, these data are patients uh, operated as a primary reconstruction within 24 to 72 hours following the injury. And then finally, my department uh, in uh, 10 uh, years, uh, as you can see, uh, we are the leading uh, department uh, for peripheral nerve surgery in Serbia. So we are, practically only one department in Serbia doing brachial plexus surgery and uh, all other entities of uh, peripheral nerve system uh, disorders. Entrapment syndromes, all kinds of entrapment syndromes, uh, all kinds of peripheral nerve injuries, uh, tumors. So we had uh, quite a number of, uh, of cases for last uh, 10 years. We develop uh, this multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach starting from uh, 90s uh, at the war time, when there was a war time in the former Yugoslavia, when we have a lot of cases uh, with uh, associated injuries. So we now uh, practice uh, one stage operation for majority of cases uh, in uh, terms of uh, functional reconstruction of, of the limb. Of course, after thorough pre-operative evaluation and uh, uh, with interactive communication with all this specialization, which I show here in this slide. So in my opinion, uh, there is uh, no better one to perform peripheral nerve surgery than uh, the neurosurgeon. However, when neurosurgeon is not doing peripheral nerve surgery, the second best option may, be, may become the best option. So keep calm and raise awareness and love brachial plexus surgery and all peripheral neurosurgery. So this is my teacher and mental tribute to my uh, mentor, Professor Miroslav Samaric. Uh, I am always presenting these photos and I, uh, this photo, I, I, am, uh, I, I am very eager to say that this is uh, what peripheral neurosurgery done to a man. So this is my mentor and uh, myself on your, uh, when I was young in 1996, then in the middle of 2000 and then when he, retired in 2013. So he, he remained the same, but you can obviously 
uh, notice some changes on, on myself. And this is my family. So thank you very much for your attention. We are going to, to the, an, another presentation of uh, first part. Uh, I, will, I will invite Pravin to, to share his screen and to uh, tell us how it is experienced in Nepal. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am Pravin Sreshtar from Nepal, and today uh, I'm going to share some of our experience about peripheral, peripheral nerve surgery in Nepal. Well, just a few words about my country, Nepal. Uh, it is a small country in South Asia, located between China and India. Uh, this is Nepal. There are two giant countries, India and China, all around Nepal. There is about a uh, population of 30 million in the whole country. Uh, Nepal is also land of Himalaya high mountains, including Mount Everest, and also land of Lord Buddha. Uh, there are about 100 neurosurgeons uh, in my country, still a very small number of neurosurgeons. But uh, the number of neurosurgical residents are increasing every year. So there are about 10 uh, neurosurgical residents every year. Uh, regarding neurosurgical services in our country, we have almost everything. And in addition to general neurosurgery, we have been doing functional neurosurgery, spinal ne uh, instrumentations, endovascular surgery in different uh, institutes in our uh, country. Well, regarding neurosurgical workload and type, uh, spine is the main chunk of neurosurgical practice, uh, occupying about 45% of total cases. Brain comes about 40% and peripheral nerves and nervous system 15%, quite a small proportion. Uh, regarding uh, peripheral nerve surgery in my country, uh, almost all the neurosurgeons are doing peripheral nerve surgery. Uh, since their neuro uh, residential period, they learn peripheral nerve surgery. Uh, some of the simple uh, peripheral nerve surgeries, uh, which are more commonly done by almost all the neurosurgeons are decompression of the compressive neuropathy like uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, tarsal tunnel syndrome, etc. Nerve injury and repair, nerve biopsy, grafting. These are done by almost all neurosurgeons in my country. In addition, some complex type of uh, peripheral nerve surgery like selective neurotomy for spastic hypertonia, brachial plexus exploration, repair with uh, intercostal nerve transfer, peripheral nerve tumors, including nerve tumors of nerve plexus. These are done uh, by senior uh, neurosurgeons, expert neurosurgeons in bigger centers. So in my center, we have been doing almost all these uh, peripheral nerve surgery in my center. And in my country, Nepal, no sub-specialty of peripheral nerve, nerve, nerve surgery yet. That means there is not yet any single neurosurgeon who is dedicated to peripheral nerve surgery. So we have to develop a PNS sub-specialty in my country. These are a few illustrations. This is a case of ulnar nerve injury in the wrist. It was explored, repaired, decompressed, repaired, and finally the patient got better from this type of client to this type of full function of the hand. This is another example of uh, peripheral nerve surgery, the tumor of lumbar plexus. You can see the uh, tumor here, suanoma, at the level of L4, L5. Then we did uh, total excision of the tumor by this retroperitoneal approach. This is a case of spastic deformity of the left hand, you can see, including left toes. Hand was like this, so we did uh, uh, selective neurotomy of different branches of the median nerve. And finally, there is a cosmetic correction of the hand, but still, functionally, it is still poor. This is an example of uh, severe uh, cloth foot deformity of a small boy. Uh, he could not stand, he could not walk. So he, when he tries to stand up, his foot, uh, feet, bilateral feet become like this. He has to stand on the dorsal of the foot, not standing on the sole, but dorsal on the foot. So he was crawling all the time. So we did selective uh, tibial neurectomy on the both side. And this is the final video you can see after several months of the surgery. He became much comfortable. He could stand very comfortably and walk, even though there is still some difficulty in walking and standing, but the condition is much better than what he had before surgery. Regarding other surgical specialties, doing peripheral nerve surgery in my country, of course, orthopedic surgeons, uh, but most of the orth orthopedic surgeons are doing uh, simple uh, you know, surgery like uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And also some of the orthopedic surgeons, they are doing uh, nerve injury repair because they get a lot of trauma cases. So they are also, they're also doing nerve injury repair, but they are not doing other types of complex peripheral nerve surgery. Hand surgeons, well, in my country, there are very few hand surgeons. Personally, I know very few. Uh, one of them is from orthopedic background and another from uh, plastic surgery background. Of course, uh, they are good uh, you know, uh, surgeons. Uh, they do almost all types of peripheral nerve surgery, but mainly in the upper limbs, of course, not in the lower limbs. And they, also, they are also not doing other complex surgery like uh, selective neurectomy or uh, you know, tumor, tumor excision of nerve plexus like that. 
regarding other surgeons like plastic surgeons and general surgeons well uh, some senior surgeons they do few a peripheral nerve surgery like this carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital nerve syndrome but most of the plastic surgeons general surgeons they are not doing uh, peripheral nerve surgery that much so in conclusion uh, uh, peripheral nerve surgery is a vital part of neurosurgery in my country uh, and scope of peripheral nerve surgery is uh, very huge i believe but it has to be explored yet in my especially in the countries like my country in nepal where the technology is still very poor we have been you know uh, doing much less pns so scope has to be explored There is a huge scope of uh, peripheral nerve surgery in my country, as I have explained. It is mainly the neurosurgeons who have been doing PNS. Uh, there, is, there are no significant competitors, no significant rivals. So we are the ones who have been doing. And definitely, uh, I think neurosurgeons are much better in peripheral nerve surgery than orthopedic or other surgeons. But it is not only neurosurgeons' job. Definitely, we need multidisciplinary cooperation and coordination among. Among, uh, you know, I'm on uh, coordination with orthopedic surgeons, coordination with other physical physiotherapists uh, for the better outcome of the patient. And definitely, we are the ones. Neurosurgeons are the ones who should lead peripheral nerve surgery, not only in my place but around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pravin, for uh, this excellent uh, presentation, and uh, I'm very pleased that in Nepal are uh, so very big interest within neurosurgeons. Uh, uh, for peripheral nerve surgery and uh, good practice. We will have opportunity to make comments uh, uh, later on. Now uh, we have, uh, let's say, first part of our uh, webinar uh, with argument pros for doing uh, peripheral nerve surgery. And I would now uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Elizabetta Basso to give us her presentation, the importance of the differential diagnosis in peripheral nerve surgery. Dr. Basso, please. Thank you and good evening to everybody. In this meeting, we are discussing uh, the role of neurosurgeon in peripheral nerve surgery. I think that uh, uh, our education, that is a neurological education, can be an advantage in particular. No, digo de verdad, mío. No salgáis de casa. No salgáis. Hay que retenerse. Ser fuerte. In particularly at the beginning of the career. At the same time, I'm sure that all neurosurgeons uh, should have. Uh, even if they are not interested in peripheral nerve surgery, a basic knowledge on peripheral nerve pathology because patients arrive to us, sorry, but arrive to us with problems, with symptoms, not with a tag in which they explain what they need, what they want, and in particular the diagnosis. So, uh, uh, neurosurgeons always uh, have to remember that the uh, nervous system doesn't finish the spine. If, you, if we do that, probably we, we do a lot of mistakes in our career and sometimes we skip different diagnoses. Even simple conditions as a foot drop can have uh, difficulties and can be a challenge for diagnosis because this condition can have different uh, causes in central nerve pathology and in peripheral nerve pathology. There is no, not only a foot drop linked to L5 radiculopathy, but also to pathology of, deeper, of peroneal nerve, sciatic nerve or lumbar plexus. Now, I will show you a few cases in which uh, all the patient has the same symptoms, but different pathology and different uh, at the same times. This is the uh, case of a man that arrived to us with a short history for month of foot drop and mild moderated pain in the lateral part of the leg. This man had a, a lumbar MRI that was negative and then a EMG that demonstrated a lesion on the common peroneal nerve. Then we perform an MRI of the knee and we arrive in a simple way to the diagnosis. It was an endoneural cyst of common peroneal nerve. This is a, an a unusual pathology in which this is a collection of synovial fluid inside the nerve. This fluid comes from the degenerated fibrotubular joint and arrive to the nerve via the articular branch. 
Surgery is the solution. We have to operate this, opening the wall of the cyst, squeezing out the fluid, and then we have to recognize and cut the articular branch. Another possibility, if we have a more orthopedic inclination, is the resection of superior tibiofibular joint. The result is the same and is always a good result. Another case is similar, a young man with the same symptomatology, pain and uh, foot drop. But this, his history is really longer, one year of pain and foot drop, six months. He did the same investigation and the same result on EMG. But when we take a look in the region of the knee, we find nothing, neither, uh, neither an entrapment nor a tumor, nothing. This patient arrived with this documentation to our attention. When we visited him, we find that there was a lesion, a deficit of posterior tibialis nerve. So we understand that the lesion can't be in the common peroneal nerve because the posterior tibialis is uh, innervated by tibial nerve. So we take a look in the sciatic nerve and we find a big sarcoma involving the sciatic nerve. We have to remove the tumors with the nerve and all the tissue around. And we know that the prognosis in this case is not nice. And we are sad because he arrived to the diagnosis one year after the beginning of the symptom. Here another case, always foot drops. This time there is no pain. This young woman did always the same uh, investigation, but when we visit her, we find spastic of the leg. And so we understand that the problem was central. And we perform a CT scan and an, an MRI and we that show us that there was a parasagittal meningioma. So same symptoms, different condition. The same consideration are valid for the pain and the weakness of the uh, upper extremities. And here, we, I want to show you another case. A young woman, 27 years old, with a severe right arm pain after uh, a whiplash injury. He had pain, she had the pain on the shoulder, on the neck, on the parascapular region, and it was uh, irradiated to the last two fingers of the hand. And the pain increased with movement and with uh, abduction. Cervical MRI was negative and also EMG. So what was the problem? When we visit this uh, girl, we find that she was positive for all the scene and the test typical of irritative thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a syndrome not so easy to diagnose. It's due to the compression of one or more neurovascular structure into the uh, thoracic outlet. And we know that there are a lot of different kinds of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. We are interested in the neurological type, generally speaking. But uh, if the atrophic one is, has a very clear symptomatological pattern and can be demonstrated by neurophysiology, the pure irritative is controversial. The reason is that the diagnosis of this syndrome is made only on the base of clinical examination. And there is, uh, and it can't be demonstrated by a radiological or neurophysiological investigation. But uh, if you believe in this syndrome, you can find a lot of patients. We treat in our department about 400 patients with neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, and 75% of them were irritative. So how we can diagnose it? Well, first of all, is the clinical examination and the experience. We need experience because uh, sometimes symptoms are not typical and there are variation in the distribution of pain, of pain and sometimes there are no vasomotor change or other characteristics that can change. The typical diagnostic investigation are without uh, meaning because they don't give us uh, information. One exception is the demonstration on X-ray or CT scan of a supranumerary rib or of a megapophysis of C7 uh, on the side of the symptoms, because we know that these abnormalities is related to 
compression by some, uh, often uh, by uh, fibrous band of C8 and T1. When we operate this uh, patient, those kind of patient, we find nothing extraordinary, generally speaking. We find generally fibrous band, supranumerary veins, some artery that cross the C8 and T1 TV compression, but there is nothing extraordinary. But there are all small um, uh, anomalies that give compression. This is what we want to see at the end of the surgical procedure. Here you can see the perfect exposition of C1 and T8. And we have, do, uh, you have to do only the compression, no neurolysis. But if we have a patient with symptoms with uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, but also with an MRI positive for a cervical disc herniation in C7, T1, or C6, C7. Thoracic outlet syndrome. But also, what we, uh, what we would do? We operate the TOS or the cervical disc? Well, I think that the majority of us probably will operate the cervical disc because it seems to be a more concrete diagnosis than uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. And in uh, most of cases, thoracic outlet syndrome is uh, considered a second choice di diagnosis. And also, we have to distinguish it from other pathology uh, that can uh, manifest, give a, a manifestation with pain in the upper arm and in the shoulder. When we operate this patient, when there is failure of conservative therapy, symptomatic asymmetric rib, and when there is a, a, a criterio, a, a, a request from the patient uh, after a full explanation with a ex adjuvantibus criteria. We can offer this surgery ex adjuvantibus because it has a very low rate of complication when she is performed by experienced surgeon because it's not so simple. Another case, the last one, a young woman with atrophy of the left hand. Left hand. In this case, there was atrophy in the part of the ulnar and median nerve, no pain. And this, the, she did the same uh, investigation, but at the EMG we find C8T1 radiculopathy. And this is the, a typical atrophic uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. This is very easy to diagnose because uh, the, the end has uh, um, an image that an image that is very typical, and uh, there is no pain in these cases, and uh, it's quite simple to diagnose. There are some times uh, that uh, we need uh, to differentiate from neurological pathology and neuropathy, or sometimes with uh, other uh, neurosurgical pathology like cervical syringomyelia. At the end of uh, my, my presentation, I have only to say that we trust too much in technology, but we have to take time for visiting the patient because only a clinical examination can orientate in a good way uh, our uh, um, instrumental investigation. And then even uh, um, even uh, there are uh, the, the greatest part of our work is uh, uh, based on simple uh, and common pathology. Sometimes we have to uh, to treat other conditions that are unusual, but not uh, so uh, rare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sabaso, for your, uh, for your uh, nice overview of differential diagnosis in. Uh, uh, a very frequent situation dealing with a patient uh, it can be a problem for solving regarding peripheral neurosurgery. Uh, we move on. Uh, I would like kindly to invite uh, Dr. Nora Dengler from uh, Charité Berlin to share with us uh, her presentation, Neurosurgeons Can Do It Better. Why? Question mark. Okay, there is some audio now. Yeah. So, question mark. Thanks to Lucas and Stefano for that, for some people, possibly provocative um, 
provocative title, but um, I do my best to fulfill your expectations to give you some hard facts and some good arguments um, to give that um, um, not only a question mark, but, um, but um, a, a, better, um, a better statement to it. So um, I confirm that I don't have any relevant financial or commercial interest and there is a possible conflict of interest. You might judge yourself, I'm a neurosurgeon. So um, let me start what we're going to talk about in the next 10 minutes. We will talk a little bit about the start, the dimensions um, of what is better in peripheral nerve surgery, about the presence in neurosurgery. And, and this for me also means if neurosurgeons can do it better than other disciplines if we are prepared for the future in peripheral nerve surgery. So let's start with the start. The history of peripheral nerve surgery can be told by many ways. And as Lucas already mentioned, wars have always been a driving force. So I could tell you a history about warfare, but um, it's Wednesday afternoon, I'm not going to do that. Um, of course, technical, um, technical developments always played a role to mention the microscope, but let me tell you a short story about people. So, um, in the very, very old days, um, we have been doctors, philosophers, mathematicians and astrologers, and some of them dedicated some of their minds um, to peripheral nerves. And there are some examples from Rome, from Greece, and also from Persia, um, where some very, very old founding fathers already made up their mind about how to treat peripheral nerve um, injuries. And, um, and syndromes. And there are some um, surgeons in general who uh, dedicated some of their work to peripheral nerves. So I have to mention Langenbeck and Dupuytren, um, but they possibly only touched that field. And I think Stefano um, um, may join me that Ferrara was one of the first surgeons who really, really went deep into peripheral nerve surgery. And then things went more complex, things are more complex and um, the surgical disciplines divided into orthopedic. And I think I have to mention Sunderland, Birch and Gilbert. Some of them have already been mentioned by um, some, other, um, some others of our webinar. And when we talk about the plastic surgeons, we have to mention Gillies, who did some great work on facial nerve, Brunel, who was kind of the father of hand surgery, as well as, of course, Narakas and Milesi. But when we go to the neurosurgical history, there are also some very, very great people who did um, dedicate their work to some parts, uh, in some parts to, to peripheral nerve surgery. There was Cushing, who had interest into peripheral nerve surgery. There, of course, is Klein, who did great, great, and um, a very, very good overview about at least all, all, or, all um, about all parts of, of peripheral nerve surgery. And there were Sami and Dolans, and these are only examples for many, many other neurosurgical founding fathers in this field. So the presence in plastic surgery, um, we have to go a little bit on their pillars. Um, what, what are they dealing with? This is aesthetics, burn surgery, hand surgery, microsurgery, craniofacial surgery. You don't see um, the name nerve in there, but we do have um, some, some very, very good people around like um, Susan McKinnon, who has to be mentioned, Julia Teresis, as well as Bertelli, who did some ground, grounding work on, on, on nerve transfers. And there's ortho, and um, this is what they also describe um, their, their cells as, is that they deal with trauma, spine, injury, degenerative infection, tumor, congenital disorders, but of the musculoskeletal system. Again, you don't find um, the name nerve in that. But we have to tribute Oberlin and Lisha Wengwongs, who were some, some great people who did um, grounding work on nerve transfers. Um, I think most of us um, use their inventions or their developments. So what is the presence in neurosurgery, in neurosurgery like? And on the left hand side, you see a very classic interpretation of how neuro, neuro neurosurgery divides in the subdisciplines. You see tumor, spine, trauma, vascular, hydrocephalus, endoscopy, functional pain, radiosurgery, and you see peripheral nerve. And I say classic because I think the field is more than, than just um, the things that you see on the left-hand side. And most of us went through training in all of these subdisciplines and then did a kind of specialization or subspecialization. But we all deal um, with dynamic things like neurophysiology, neuromodulation, 
imaging, visualization, and brain and nerve machine interface. And again, if we go deeper into peripheral nerve surgery in neurosurgery, you have the classic interpretation on the left hand side, where we deal with nerve tumor, nerve injury, nerve compression, you see a lot of nerve in there, it's good. And on the right hand side, um, you see what I think or my interpretation of the field also is so uh, we go a little bit broader, we treat pain, we do this part or some of us do that by neuromodulation. We go deeper into reconstruction. We think about genetic or genetic disease who influence our patients. And of course, um, we develop by innovation and diagnostics, surgical technique, biology and bioengineering. So look at um, the presence in neurosurgery. I think this is also a reason why we do better because there are these great people and this is only um, an overview this is only an excerpt there are many 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 more but i think um, all of them push the field and they um, teach people so um, this is a bright uh, presence in the moment and there are many many more including all the panelists of our webinar so um, the question neurosurgeons can do it better for me also implies are we prepared for the future and let, let me give you some concluding arguments why i think we can answer all these questions with a yes so the neurosurgeon doesn't stop at the hand which is true for some of the disciplines we are microsurgical experts by training um, in the best um, case we, we start to work with a microscope from day one on um, of our residency we treat pain multimodal and I think this is very very important we um, don't stop um, at the local treatment of the nerve we can do many many other things um, including um, SCS DRG peripheral nerve stimulation and we can even go a level higher we can do um, central stimulation and so on um, and I think um, we are well prepared for the future in mastering surgical technique, visualization, pathophysiology, and interfaces as we are very technical. The neurosurgeon of today is kind of a cyborg and um, we work with a lot of techniques and I think this is very important to push the surgical technique um, to the future. And last, but not least, um, I think we do have strong leaders and we do have strong societies that help us to push this field at the basis and the top. So this is why I think neurosurgeons can do it better. Thank you, Nora, for this uh, exciting presentation. Uh, of course, uh, we'll continue our discussion later on. Now I will invite... Uh, I say something to Nora. I don't know in Germany, but in Italy, we, can't, we, we couldn't say that we have strong leader and society pushing the field actually who is really pushing the field and i am thanking him for uh, and i will thank him forever for what he's doing is professor rasulic this is the truth i absolutely agree thank you stefano uh, we move on <laughs> uh, dr capone a young neurosurgeon's perspective on peripheral neurosurgery am i on the right side yes you are on the right side so please, so Yes, I am here. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm starting to start the presentation. Okay, so good afternoon. And first of all, big thank to Professor Rasulic, Professor Ferraresi and ENS for having organized such an amazing webinar. Something was needed in our, uh, for our branch. Uh, I've been thinking how to discuss such a delicate topic in a simple and funny way. And then I took inspiration from the yearly main attraction of Faenza, the city where my department is located. This is a palio, a medieval style competition, very similar to the most famous one in Siena. So I decided to compare the topic of peripheral nerve surgery to the Niballo, the palio of Faenza, uh, in which the four or five districts in the city they contend every year for the urban supremacy. Between each district, there is huge rivalry, also due to historical and cultural uh, reasons. And this is symbolized also from the uniform, each one with different color and emblem. I would say that in the same way, peripheral nerve surgery is disputed among the four different and very competitive surgical branches. Uh, as we know, there are neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons, 
hand surgeons and orthopedics. But as we already discussed in the interesting previous presentation from Nora, of course we support the neurosurgical team. The thing is, are we really on the right side? Clearly, neurosurgeons should be the one who has the wider knowledge on the anatomy and physiology of the very far nerve system, the one who should bestow the um, electrophysiological exam, the, the reading of the electrophysiological exam, and as a clear vision on the neurological outcome and the, the management of pain. But neurosurgeons are also the usually less accustomed with dealing with different districts in the nerve, such as tendons, joints, and bones, and they usually also lack a control on the functional aspects, such as dynamic movements and locomotion, most of all. So can a neurosurgeon become a real nerve surgeon, and how? Probably the best trained nerve surgeon, a general nerve surgeon, is someone who can master the skill of each of the four contenders. So the ability to, and the knowledge on the anatomical and functional pathways from, of the nerve from the neurosurgeons, the confidence in dealing with near tissues from plastic surgeons, the control of rehabilitation aspects from orthopedics, and also the capability to perform other surgical strategies such as nerve tendon transfer from hand surgeons and also orthopedics. So at the end, can a neurosurgeon really consider himself on the right side if motivating to master this branch? From my standpoint, there is probably not a right or a wrong side. Uh, every nerve surgeon, it doesn't matter if starting as neurosurgeon or plastic surgeon, should first of all have a multidisciplinary approach and a multidisciplinary view with a, a wide focus on the whole pathology and not all on the mere surgical time. Moreover, uh, as I experienced, and a lot of us young neurosurgeons experienced during the training, the neurological and uh, physiotherapical aspects are also very important and are usually less considering in the training process. Uh, but they also, they have to be meant as pivotal as the, um, the other ones for the outcome and the treatment of the patient. And these two aspects don't have to be forgot, forgotten. If I speak back to the period of Enza, usually during the celebration night, the Niballo, this statue of a Saracen soldier, is burned uh, during the celebration, also to symbolize and to welcome the new Palio and the future generation of contenders for the next years. In the same way, which are the old habits that we can burn? about peripheral nerve surgeon and which goals should be achieved for the future of the next uh, generation. I would say, first of all, improve education and awareness about the importance of peripheral nerve surgery, because this is a subspecialty sub of neurosurgery who is still controversial and underrated. Uh, second all, uh, secondly, promote promoting the multidisciplinary, the multidisciplinary confrontation and cooperation, and maybe constitution of centers of excellence and of training. And last but not least, to unify the standard of training in all countries. Uh, in conclusion, I would say thank, thank you for, to all the person and all the organization who support peripheral, the evolution of peripheral nerve surgery. I would like to thank them for the terrific work, but also for enlightening us youngsters the path to this difficult uh, journey and to overcome all the obstacles that stands in the way on this journey to become a real nerve surgeon. Uh, I think we should always consider the old proverb that says that Asmutsi never made a skilled sailor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crescenzo, for your enthusiasm and for joining us and uh, sharing your um, opinion that uh, you are on the right side. So <laughs> we continue together, further together. I think so as well. <laughs> I think, I think Lucas, Crescenzo, uh, throw the stone in, in, in the pond because I was trying many years ago to constitute like a, a, a master specialty 
encompassing true nerve surgery, secondary surgery, knowledge of uh, orthopedic. We, in Italy, well, for me, uh, it was impossible, but too many difficulties. And then in Italy, we are really lacking because Giorgio Brunelli and uh, Morelli have passed away. So uh, Piero Raimondi is nice, but he's getting old. Uh, so uh, we, we lack a little bit of specialty. I think I, this is a proposal for uh, Lucas, for the young, I don't say neurosurgeons, surgeons who want to uh, perform peripheral nerves to organize like a four year master uh, going into different places in Europe uh, to have a, uh, a qualification uh, in the sector of orthopedic pertaining to peripheral nerves it's not important to learn to make a hip replacement, of course, but to do an osteotomy, to do a arthrodesis. And this is the proposal for you, Lucas, uh, your fantasy, which is always full of, uh, uh, of inspiration. If we could, uh, we are at our disposal. You, we can use Rovigo if you want. We can organize, a, I, I would say, a three-year master um, uh, to get a, this uh, subspecialty for the surgeon who would like to perform it, or four years or two years, it depends on, we can discuss it. This is a good. Another thing is cooperation. Cooperation is a nice word, filling the mouth of many people in the world. But I can assure you that it is very difficult even to get two people making the same thing in the same morning in a big hospital. So be friend of every orthopedic of your vascular, or be friend, ask for advice, use it for difficult things, but as soon as possible, try to become free from them. Because if you can't do it alone, then it's okay and you grow. If there is nothing particular in cutting a bone or transferring a tendon. You have to know the basics and then you can do it. You have to overcome your medical legal fear because if you cut the humerus and you have a malunion, you can be sued. This is the real problem. But as much as you become expert, this will happen uh, less and less. What you what you say, uh, Lucas, about this proposal? Stefano, uh, we have been discussed uh, for, on this idea uh, on the different levels, on different uh, time zones, different meridians. I will. Uh, the idea is great. I support this very much. Uh, I would uh, suggest that we. Uh, wait for uh, Mariano to finish his uh, presentation, then we can take as, a, as a, some kind of uh, conclusion, uh, make this kind of uh, initiative uh, for future. Although it's all, already, already is, uh, let's say, uh, mingling, appearing uh, something like uh, some specialization as a nerve surgeon, but uh, mentoring by neurosurgeon or mentoring by orthopedic surgeon or by plastic surgeon. This is something which we have to, to discuss in the details. Okay. Gen generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, we are doing something. Uh, now it's uh, the European Academy for um, uh, Innovation and Diversity within the uh, European Commission for, uh, for a cent as a center of excellence. Uh, it's now running a project uh, with uh, uh, 17 departments uh, of uh, neurosurgical departments uh, for uh, establishing a uh, European standard for training in uh, neurosurgery, including peripheral neurosurgery. This is also, I think, a great success uh, for uh, being part of this project. And generally speaking, we'll develop it in, in the future. But now let us... Uh, continue with uh, our round table. We have a round table uh, about pain. There is no some time limit, but uh, I would suggest to make uh, this some kind of uh, open discussion, which I will yeah. kindly ask you, Stefano, to, to, to run it. Uh, I clear the screen and show one half minute of video about the microsurgical rhizotomy which is the best uh, armamentarium uh, uh, to treat the neuropathy. That's what I want to suggest. You, you will now take a uh, floor for this uh, round table, please, and uh, make a 
coordination with uh, with the panelists and uh, any, anybody who wants to make a question. Then we'll continue with the uh, okay. second First part. of all, I will show this video and then we can comment about this uh, technique. Why is black? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's not. And you see, this is the intradural part, the exposure in the total palsy. Uh, neuropathic pain must be done from C4 to T2. We start with checking which root is evulsed and which not, and then trying to identify the posterior lateral sulcus. You see, the sulcus must be flat, and when you approximate to the sulcus, the way becomes flat. When you trespass the other part, the pyramidal tract, then you become a negative spike. And uh, then you have identified the posterior lateral sulcus. You see there is no help because there are no roots. Then you coagulate very lightly. Then you cut the posterior lateral sulcus with the ocular lancet. And the gesture is to open like a banana the posterior lateral sulcus. And as much as you can do this, you will have a good result. The secret is not so much coagulating in depth, but going into depth, opening the sulcus. This tears away, and then you, have, you get the antalgic effect. Uh, you know the basis of a drosotomy is the uh, interruption of the sick interneurons of the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando. And this uh, is thought, but it is effective, to interrupt the med interneurons firing to the cortex. So thank you. Now I invite the panelists to tell me something about their experience with pain, especially uh, I am interested in complex pain syndrome, which was called uh, uh, algodystrophia or causalgia. Lucas, what do you think? Well, there are people having very minor injury and they start to have tremendous pain in the arm. They, they have some shoulder distraction for nothing, uh, no subluxation, nothing of all, or uh, wrist distraction. And they start with pain, pain, burning, uh, biting, dog biting, and then it's tremendous. That is true. We have a, I have a several uh, cases with uh, very, very difficult, case, complex cases for treatment. Uh, but uh, now it would be nice to, to discuss all together about all these kind of modalities. Yeah, yeah. I throw the stone. What, what the panel does for pain due to inguinal hernia surgery? You know, there is a pain that sometimes comes and it is really uh, tremendous. Uh, you can reoperate. What, what, what the panel does, you know, the in, inguinal hernia pain, post-inguinal surgery. So, um, Stefano, when I, when I may, may answer for, for Charité Berlin, we, we have a lot of these patients and um, some of them do have a medial a nerve injury. So the genitofemoral nerve is often disturbed um, and sometimes we have conflicts with the net that has been uh, implanted and these are not easy to treat. Um, we do have a very good team of ultrasonography. So sometimes we can see that there is a local conflict due to high resolution ultrasound. And then we give it a chance to do a primary treatment at the nerve, either decompression, sometimes termic neurectomy. Um, and if we don't succeed, we go the neuromodulation path. So, um, in these cases, it is not easy to do peripheral nerve stimulation, but we think about um, DRG or SCS. But I usually try to do, to give them one shot um, directly at the nerve. And uh, Stefano, 
do you hear? Yes. yes. Oh, Mariano, yes. yes. Okay. Oh, what well, I, I, I agree with Nora. What we do is we usually try to get out of the mess of the net where, where the nerve is, is trapped. So we go proximally. We try to localize the place by ultrasound or maybe by MRI. And once we, we do it, we try with a blockade. And if it works, well, we go for an open surgery. Probably it ends up with an erectomy and putting the nerve inside the mus muscular uh, abdominal wall. That's what we do in those cases. What percentage of success do you have with this uh, going back and following? Uh, the, because the nerve the, which are injured are probably very tiny branches, not, not, not the main nerve. Because in the world while we are speaking, there are millions of inguinal hernia surgeries. And I don't think that the injury of small nerve is so rare. So why some people experience this pain and why, fortunately, the vast majority not. Do you have an explanation uh, for this? Physiopathologically? Probably, probably there is a direct uh, injury of that nerve. What I would say, two success things for this surgery is that if you localize very well and you have luck and you can localize the injury, then you have very good chance, and this is the second good thing about this, of, uh, of uh, re getting rid of the, of the pain. But on the other side, uh, so our view of this surgery is positive. Anyway, we saw many times that the, uh, the pain recurs. So we have to go more proximally, again, in many times the rate of recurrence is not so low as we want it to be. Shimon, what you do? Just you shot them with a gun or with a missile, so you stop <laughs> them. Depends on, depends on clinical observation. This is more important part. If you found a clear picture of the local injury, local injury, and of course, if it's will be investigated by ultrasound because the MRI in many cases smooths the neuroma. Ultrasound is much better. We operate this case. Small, small uh, seizure and uh, looking for post-traumatic neuroma, removal neuroma and implanted nerve into the muscle. But specifically for iliointinal nerve, this is problematic nerve. Results is not so good. We try to treat conservatively pain clinic, maybe local injection. If it don't help, and also follow up approximately six months. Picture will be similar. The operation. I can share you some experience. Uh, of, uh, we have all several cases, but one was uh, very difficult, and we, it is uh, still a medical legal case uh, operated by three times by a general surgeon, once in a radical, uh, regional medical center, two times in a in a university clinic, uh, and then he came to us with. Uh, very complex pain uh, following the, this um, inguinal hernia surgery and then uh, trying uh, with some two surgical attempts to, to solve this problem. But uh, we first time, in, on the first time, we didn't want to, to go with any kind of blockades because uh, this is, uh, usually we are doing like uh, Mariano said, and this is, uh, like uh, I would like to say some kind of standard procedure and Nora also said that so we are doing trying to talk, avoid surgery as much as possible if it is helpful to do do it with some uh, conservative treatment or some blockades that's fine but uh, it's not we then proceed to surgery and surgery on the first hour surgery there was a, a resecting of all uh, sen sensitive nerves here in a, in a, in the in the operative region and then the pain was diminished and the patient is, was almost happy. But this, after a few months, there was, a, a, let's say, reestablishing the pain and also very huge problem. And then it appears that it was a huge scar tissue, which uh, was, uh, let's say, the cause of the compression of the femoral nerve. So we then operate uh, then again and make a huge deliberation of the, Femoral nerve in the inguinal region, 
And even after that, uh, and the neurolysis and everything, and even after that, he was uh, unhappy with all these problems. And of course, uh, sued the hospital and the doctor in, a, in, a, in the regional medical center who operated him. But anyhow, this, this uh, it helped him in some in some some instance. The, the pain was according to the all uh, measurement scales, and our evaluation was a little after this diminished, but not disappeared. So the the panel thinks it is worth going through echography and then resecting. So I think most of you think of this. I've lost a little bit the hope with this pathology and I did it before I removed the, the net and I put without the net and the fascia but now I'm really disappointed also if uh, we have only half of success still the other half of success is like a dog biting your shoulder so now I resort more to the new modulation if possible now I, I will throw you another another stone in the left, the lesion of the saphenous nerve at the medial part of the knee. Did you happen this to see these cases? This is another impossible case to solve. I could say even more impossible than the inguinal hernia. Nora, do you have experience with the uh, saphenous vein branches interruption at the medial part of the knee? Um, yes, we do. So in Berlin, we, we don't have many surface, but um, saphenous neuropathy can also be surface neuropathy when you do your adductors and you get in contact to your board. Um, some people do get pain by it, but we also have the, 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 the classic um, the classic variants or some lesions after after knee surgery and so on. So um, of course we do diagnostics. Usually we do de decompression. Um, and in the worst case, we also do termic neurectomy. But um, I'm, I agree that some cases are um, very, very, they come back and then we take one step further and we do neurectomy. You know, I always make, make a tail because, I re well, cutting a nerve, in my opinion, is not a very good thing to do. I always have a, re a recollection of a case with a trigger finger, a fourth trigger finger, where an orthopedic without a uh, magnifying loop uh, has cut a digital nerve. Then the nerve has repaired, repairing but still pain. Then another surgeon came and cut the digital nerve at the beginning from the, uh, the median nerve. Then uh, the pain was more. Then another came and opened the carpal tunnel. Then another one came and cut the median nerve. Then another one came and cut the median nerve at the elbow. And then another one again uh, cut the median and the other nerve at the elbow. The patient is terrible, not able to walk. She developed a psychiatric hemiplegia. We don't know why. So, but cutting all, all, of course, I don't need because there are people that are me with more experience than me, but I warn you cut against cutting the nerve. Uh, you probably uh, would like to help the patient, but cutting a nerve, especially if it is a major nerve, it cannot be uh, repaired, you cannot go back in, in this case, uh, it is not a very safe practice. Uh, years neuromodulation is the choice and we hope that there is a, a even more more and more possible to do nowadays there is a ni very nice device the steam wave i have no disclosure but the steam wave is activated by bluetooth has no need of charging it is just an electrode put only once in the place then you have like a mobile uh, in your pocket and then you stimulate, uh, regulate the, uh, the intensity via Bluetooth. You don't have to put any device under the skin of the, of the belly like before. 
uh, you have not to remove this device to change the batteries. So it is a very, very nice thing. It is the steam wave and I uh, advise you to try and use this because can be the solution for very uh, difficult and I, I dare say impossible cases to solve. I, I agree. So we have kind of a stepwise approach. So we usually go primary to the nerve when we um, have any kind of pain syndrome. Um, and if the pain, uh, the patient doesn't get better, then we reevaluate. We do have um, the neuromodulation team on board, and sometimes we decide for direct peripheral nerve stimulation. There's sometimes in the extremities, um, as you mentioned, then, then stim wave is an option because you can put it directly um, to um, close to the Bluetooth locator in the extremity. I think it's it's a very good and easy option. Um, and then we discuss whether um, um, we go back in and sometimes um, depending on how the nerve or how much the nerve is injured, how if there's a local neuroma, um, then we think about neurectomy and if not, and the pain is still there and we cannot do any more things with decompression and we think about a direct neuromod neuromodulation technique, including sometimes stim wave because that's easier um, with a stimulator close to, to, the, to the electrode. So I agree, this is a good option that has been, or that has been coming up in the last years. Natalia asked uh, on a chat, uh, any suggestions about uh, pain syndrome after injections into sciatic nerve as a post-injection on neuropathy? Same, neuromodulation. You don't find anything. There is no point in going there. Do you do neurolysis or it doesn't make sense? You can do, of course, if you mm -hmm. want to do it stepwise. If you, have, if you have time to lose or surgeries to do, you can perform, expose. It is anyway a big surgery to expose the sciatic nerve mm -hmm. uh, under the pillow. You have to cut the gluteus and so on. And, and in my experience, it doesn't work. It seems to work at the beginning the patient has a placebo effect, but then you wait two months, he, can, he or she come back. The best thing is to learn to perform correctly the injection in the outer part of the bottle. Uh, I, I do. Uh, of course, this is I, a joke. Uh, I think neuro, you, we should recur to uh, resort to neuromodulation. What about, what about, uh, I, I, uh, please, 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 who will, Stefano Mariano? Mariano, yes. No, I, I, I do agree with Stefano that uh, it's better to know how to put uh, an injection. But our experience with uh, neurolysis there at the sciatic nerve, uh, very proximally after uh, an injection injury, is not so, so bad. So, and uh, besides, the approach can be not so big because you don't need to cut the wall gluteus uh, muscle, the, the major gluteus muscle. You can go through the fibers and get into the place yeah. if you if you yeah. have a good uh, ultrasound or probably an MRI. Because you don't know where is the lesion. You have to explore. Yeah, with, with an MRI, you know perfectly where the lesion is. Stefano, you forgot, you forgot that uh, Mariano has a Daniela Binaghi, who is expert in MRI ev evaluation of the nerves. Uh, so yes. he's, 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 he's a little no. bit disappointed by all these things, also the pain for the supraclavicular anesthesia, local anesthesia, and then developing pain. I, I really don't understand. If you do, they are very attentive. They inject only local anesthetic, how the patient can be, he can have a damage. That must be something wrong, something which is, which rests on the characteristics of the patients. They are not made. I'm not saying they are made but they are probably not prone to be treated. They don't like manipulation of their tissues. There must be something. Uh, because the, it, it's not injected acid, it's injected an, local anesthetic. Sometimes they're I would like yeah, to- Yeah, but if you, if, if you put two million uh, units of penicillin inside a sciatic nerve, then it's not- you do When you have a tonsillitis and you do penicillin, it's aching, I confirm. Uh, well, uh, just before I share, uh, share some of my experience uh, regarding this issue, I would like to invite and to encourage all participants and all who are watching us and having the possibility to, to 
raise a question, to uh, write a question uh, on uh, this uh, question and answer set, uh, which is uh, on the now part of the screen. So please do it and uh, feel free to, to do it. Uh, this kind of lesion, of uh, injection lesion, for example, lesion of the median nerve, in some, some situation can be life threatening because uh, very fast developing of the compartment syndrome and uh, needed for the uh, fasciotomy and uh, decompression uh, exploration with the vascular surgeon and uh, uh, exploration of the whole, uh, this uh, injured lesion. We have this kind of uh, situation. So this is something which is Yes, yes, yes. And the hand was, and was really uh, jeopardized, all hand. And then in the, in the treatment was uh, six months and more uh, until the, let's say, situation is, is settled down. So this is, this is especially when what Mariano said, when you put uh, some, some, some uh, uh, neurotoxic uh, medica medication in, in directly yeah, to the nerve. This is the case of Kobats. Many, many times you don't need to put any, any toxic medication. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what is your experience about uh, post amputation uh, uh, pain, like a phantom pain and limb pain or something like that? Especially when you have, a, when you have a both, limb, uh, what, both leg amputating. Big problem, but there should be a difference between the stump pain and the neuropathic deafferentation pain. You should try to distinguish this. Yeah, of course, no, but there is a panel discussion. You have some hope. If it is not a stamp, electric stimulation, neuromodulation. And if it is a stamp? If it, there is the stamp, you try to conceal, to heal, to hide the stump into the bone, if uh, it not, has not been done, you, you must try to conceal the stump from the position where the patient sits or puts the prosthesis. But I can tell you that at the beginning, I, I had the impression that there were many neuromas, but nowadays I think there are also many neuropathic pain is what the medieval monks says. When you destroy the image of God, then you don't know what can happen. We have operated opera several cases uh, with some pain uh, because there are a lot of, uh, let's say, war veterans, invalids, etc., etc., in, uh, in this region with a uh, huge uh, pain and uh, we resected uh, the stumps we are resecting the neuromas, usually the neuromas are both on sciatic and peroneal component, and even also to the, the, depend on the level of the amputation to the different uh, branches, you have always neuroma. Then we, uh, let's say, make a suture, direct suture of, uh, of uh, tibial and peroneal component. Uh, All the neurocampsies. So exactly, like and then put it in something, and it, it appears in, a, let's say, around the, I would say, 17 cases, uh, nice diminishing of, of, of the pain. This is a hope, yes. Yeah. You, have to go, you have to go with attempt. There is no uh, safe rule, but you have to go with attempt. So, uh, we have uh, three questions uh, just to, to see uh, Taras Petriv from Ukraine. What do you think about taking phrenic nerve for neurotization, nerve transfer of musculocutaneous nerve in upper trunk brachial plexus injury? This is not related to the pain, but we can answer now. And then uh, let's do it. And uh, then we have two more questions uh, uh, to discuss in order to, or we should wait to finish this and then to answer after the presentation. Because we have to move on. We have uh, two more lectures, technically three lectures, and then uh, to, to discuss all these questions. Can I answer? We use it if there is no other chance, provided that the other phrenic nerve is working because it happened to have the surprise uh, before not having any problem 
after surgery that the contralateral phrenic nerve from season doesn't work. I remember very well an obstetrical palsy uh, doing this, so it can happen also in adults. And uh, before doing phrenic nerve uh, neurotization, be sure that the other phrenic nerve is working. But it is fine. If you don't have any other solution, it's a good thing to do. It can be done. Mariano, long term. Yeah. Mariano, you are, you are an, as, an expert. In as a, no, I, I, I don't have too much to, to add to what Stefan said. I, we, we, we usually use phrenic nerve. Also, we, we, the key point is the selection of the patient because if you select uh, the right patient, as he said, with a, a good phrenic nerve on the other side, a thin uh, and young uh, person and so on, so on, so on. There are many things uh, that restrict the use of phrenic nerve. But once you pass on to the next step, which is, okay, this is a candidate for a phrenic nerve uh, donor uh, section, well, it is a very, very good nerve you have perhaps around 80% of good results. So I know, I know many people do not do uh, phrenic nerve, do not use phrenic nerve as donor, but we usually do. Having said that, having said that, I don't know, we are now in a COVID situation. So uh, I would think it twice okay. in this you are, situation. We must, we must be more prudent in the COVID. Yes, in this case can be a problem. What happened before yes. COVID to the long term uh, when one gets old? Uh, I, as always, I said, we will not survive our plexus patients. So it is not my business what happens when they are old. Yes, I agree with uh, Mariana and Stefano. Can anybody uh, uh, other to add uh, something for this uh, question uh, regarding phrenic nerve? If not, uh, Tarash, if you hear us, uh, I hope you are satisfied with the, with the answer. Uh, another question is from uh, Khaled Dai Ali. Uh, Khaled is, uh, uh, created a Society for Peripheral Nerve Surgery in the United Arab uh, Emirates. Uh, and uh, he's a very interesting and devoted in peripheral nerve surgery. I know him personally. Patient, he... Uh, ask a question, a patient with uh, exposed supraclavicular gunshot wound and has plexus injury who is an operating table for debridement and you are invited in the operating room, would you do the decompression, exploration or wait? You can see the questions I think in your uh, question and answer chat. So question is, uh, patient is in the operating room uh, due to the supraclavicular gunshot wound and it is operated by another surgeon. So uh, another surgeon, due to the situation or whatever, made a plexus injury intraoperatively. And you are invited in the order to do something. We are inviting in the order to do Same surgery, I am invited. The same surgery, same surgery, yes. It depends what he has done, of course. If it has cut the nerve, we have to go to neurotization. If it is an upper palsy, a triple neurotization, no point in repairing, go to neurotization. No, no, uh, that's, that's it. But, but uh, uh, he's interesting. Uh, should we do decompression of the plexus, do something like an immediate uh, nerve repair? Should we do exploration only? Should we wait for the second stage? This is the question. You, you are called by a colleague having done in the... For example, for example, vascular surgeon or general surgeon who is exploring this yeah, patient... The surgery is contemporary. They are calling you with the patient open. Yes, yes. Yes, you have to go and see what they did. If they cut as... A, for example, in tumors, it is, happens very often that the oncologists, which, who do not understand anything about peripheral nerves, they cut very largely, they, they, very widely, the field. There is no point in repairing. You, you do the triple neurotization. Gives better results. Um, we have this situation sometimes. So I think to, to give him the advice, if you get called um, and you are invited, you this is my advice, you always go there. And the um, good thing is, um, 
nowadays I do have a kind of a mobile intraoperative electrophysiology that I can um, use myself. So I used to do intraoperative neurophysiology to see if um, what is exposed is still working. Sometimes if it's trauma or gunshot, um, you possibly have difficulties to get oriented and so on. So um, if I called and if I'm invited to surgery, I do perform intraoperative electrophysiological examinations because um, then you know at hand um, what, what is working and, and what is not. And then you can make a plan with a surgeon. And if it's a, a larger reconstructive surgery, you can schedule it for a second, um, for a second approach. But if it can be done in that um, surgery, then I, I would do that considering the um, overall situation of the patient. If he's instable, if there's vascular injury, sometimes you have to put these things first. I think this is important too, to have a view about the whole patient, that um, if um, the nervous structures are exposed, um, there is a chance to perform um, electrophysiology, electrophysiology intraoperatively. You don't, don't have to wait, you don't have to postpone, um, and you can be at first hand for reconstruction. Else? Yes, may, may, let me add uh, to what Nora said. Uh, I absolutely do agree. The, the, the immediate uh, time uh, when the, 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 the patient is open is the best chance to see what's going on. So if you don't have, if you don't have a intraop a neurophysiology uh, because you are on walk, on call, or whatever, or you don't have it directly, anyway, it is it's good to see if the nerve is cut it, you can repair it at the, at the same time. And it is, it is, if it's in continuity, then you can uh, uh, wait and see. And you already know the, the, the feeling when you have to go back if it doesn't recover after uh, uh, the, waiting, uh, the waiting period. Let, excuse me, let, let, let me imagine this scenario. You are called by a general surgeon operating only because the nerve is cut. Because if the nerve is not cut, why are they calling you? No, no, no. He, he, he spoke about a, a, a gunshot wound, a supraclavicular gunshot wound. The, the, the question was that, was there about a gunshot wound, supraclavicular, gunshot. that was operated? Gunshot. No, gunshot. Yeah. Seth, no, check the, the question, please, on, on, the, on the question and answer uh, chat. So we have an expert of gunshot. It's, it's not a iatrogenical injury. No, no. This is, as he wrote, iatrogenic injury during the uh, solving the patient for the, the due to the gunshot injuries. He, he I, can't imagine. I can't imagine. One, one has been shot and then there is another surgeon trying to damage again the patient. I cannot imagine. Uh, listen, Stefan. Who is going to operate or this uh, in, in during the war, during the war time, we had a lot of these cases. Lot yes. of these cases. Okay. During the war, I would not go and help. I say close and then take time and do a triple neurotization if it is a super with good hand. Otherwise, to try to reconstruct the plexus. Immediately. But he, uh, if it is a total injury, it must try immediately. Uh, uh, we, usually, we used to do if they invite us, as uh, their obvious uh, other colleague surgeon invite us as uh, uh, his uh, very uh, big concerns that he cut the, some part of the plexus during the exploration of the of the gunshot wound or uh, trying to, to stop bleeding and to find the proximal distal part of the artery and make a... Uh, yeah. the, field, the field can be very difficult to understand. So I would not go and help. I would say, now try to stop the bleeding, make the breathment, and then we will see. I would not go into a, a mess of bleeding of vessels. Uh, I think is not a very good condition. And I don't believe in the plexus to have a good idea to do. I prefer to settle the situation with the patient and align with them and then make a, a complete uh, study of clinical study and 
see what we can do in a, in a second second third term. But of course, Any I had not, I, I never I was never in the war. I was only in Neapolis. Uh, we have is is much like a war in Neapolis sometimes, but it's we are, not like a war. We have some some experience in these uh, uh, situations. So you, we the, the the important question is: Are we like an hour decision joining this operation or not? If we are joining, we are exploring. We are exploring the plexus immediately, whole plexus. Yeah, and we are seeing. We are seeing what is going on. If the if the, if the if the nerve is cut and then and the, there is a clean section, we we, we of course yes. If the, if the situation is not clear, it's better to close and wait. If said if situation is uh, not clear, like uh, uh, partial blast, blast blast injury due to the gunshot injury or something like that, lesion in continuity, whatever, we don't have a. Uh, the diagnostic interoperative uh, physiology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we explore the the, the person finish. But if it's something, if the nerve do, is not it, cut, it has the possibility to recover. I don't think it is wise if the nerve is not cut, all bite damage to cut and. No, 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 no. That's that's out of out of sense. Out of. Neurophysiological monitoring says that nothing is passing. I yeah, don't think. But, but there the, is the only. Two possibilities: the nerve is cut and the nerve is in continuity. Exactly. If the nerve is in continuity, it is better to wait. But the colleague call you, the colleague call you because he is afraid that he cut something. Okay, I can help you. I can help him and and, and see what happens and try assisting closing and helping if there is a vascular damage. But I wouldn't go into the repair if the nerve is not cut. I help okay. him uh, as. A not for repairing the plexus. Okay. Uh, any other comment on this, Shivan? You are also also very experienced in uh, in uh, this kind type of uh, situations. Can you tell us something? Emergency nerve surgery in cases of gunshot wound is not so good. Recovery is very slow or no no results. I completely agree with Stefano to wait approximately two months. First of all, it's emergency surgery, vessel, et cetera. And after two months, exploration. But our experience is not neurotization for gunshot wound generally is local injury, it's two, three centimeters in brachial plexus. And nerve grafts work, work, work very well. The interfascicular nerve grafts, a few grafts for reconnection, are finally results is the most of the patient possibility to return parts of the function, maybe more. Uh, all this, you know, I don't recommend emergency surgery in cases of gunshot wounds. <laughs> Only for stab wound, emergency surgery is okay. But for gunshot wounds, so many factors. First of all, what is gunshot wound? It's thermal effect, short effect. It's, uh, uh, you don't know what happened. After two months, it's quiet situation. You quietly doing elective surgery, maximal microsurgery, and you, finally you have results with this patient. Okay, any other comment? We have another, uh, one more question from Milan Mladenovski. Uh, I suppose it's from Macedonia. Uh, what is the percent of nerve recovery after nerve trauma surgery in all departments you present? What is the percent of nerve recovery after nerve trauma surgery in all the departments that you present? In the, in the, too many variables. It depends on the nerve, on uh, of what kind of plexus injury. It depends. Pose a question more precise, and I can give you the percentage. This also depends from nerve. Not every nerve is same. <laughs> Part of the nerve, for example, accessory nerve or radial nerve is excellent motor recovery. From another side, median or ulnar nerve recovery is significantly less. This is a really question, big uh, uh, general question. So this is uh, not easy to give a, a proper answer in uh, terms of percentage, but uh, if we are trying to say something regarding this, uh, peripheral nerve surgery is uh, 
successful surgery and uh, in general we have a nice percentage of uh, uh, very well recovered patients depending on the type of the nerve, type of the injury, timing of the surgery and so and so. It's like to asking if you are happy to be married. So <laughs> it depends on the wife. Yeah. Uh, one more. Uh, we have a. We now we now went to the to the questions and answers. But I, in order to to keep the the tempo and to keep the the schedule, I will now uh, ask uh, all. Uh, participants who raised the, the questions to be a little bit more patient to finish with the presentation. We have three, four more presentations and then uh, we'll, we'll continue with the question. In the meantime, you just uh, shoot your questions on the question and answer uh, chat and uh, we will answer to all of your questions. So now I will kind of ask uh, uh, to go through the, to move to the Second part of our webinar, like a controversies in uh, this uh, uh, story, I would uh, like to invite uh, Professor Ferrarezi to give us his lecture, lecture joint and muscle biomechanics, tendons, bone, and hand surgery, thoughts and recommendations. Well, my opinion about peripheral nerves is different. We don't do it better. Or we can't do it, we can do it better, but we have to study and to learn much of the orthopedic, biomechanics, physiological science. If we don't do this, we'll be always uh, be a, uh, a stamp of a peripheral nerve surgeon, not complete. Because if we don't do this, we can ask colleagues, orthopedic to help, to help us to make collaboration, but most of the time it is difficult and you cannot repair a radial nerve having no result and leave the patient to the destiny, to its destiny. This is not possible. So please, if you want to be complete, you have to study and to learn biomechanics and simple orthopedic gestures. Uh, all these are the problem. And uh, the CAP says that orthopedic surgery is easy. It is true, it is easy. Uh, if, you, if you are able to do a microsurgery in the brain, why are you not cutting a bone? Where is the problem? Or cutting a tendon? The problem is to win your medical legal field. Study, especially in peripheral nerves, the tomb of the neurosurgeon is the shoulder. Normally, we don't understand much of the biomechanics and the organization of the shoulder. I have uh, my, my friend, Malesi, has a great merit with this regard because he always speaks about the shoulder. He looks more like an orthopedic surgeon of the shoulder than a neurosurgeon. But he's right. In all the plexus of the adult, in all the plexus of the uh, baby, he always puts the question of the shoulder and is really studying much of the movements, much of the biomechanics. So please try and understand perfectly how the shoulder works. Uh, for instance, that you need how to have a stable uh, shoulder blade and not making mistakes like an arthrodesis without the serratus anterior. If you don't have the serratus anterior, which keeps the medial part of the shoulder blade against the spine, you will only extend the weight of the arm uh, to the omerus, to the shoulder with the scapula. So you have a winging, everything winging, no stability, and the patient is more and more in difficulty than before your arthrodesis. So remember, arthrodesis requires a perfect serratus anterior. So it is a good thing, not for avulsive injuries, but for uh, stretch injury with good stamps and so, 
with the good thoracic nerve. So this is another case, the accessory nerve damage. And try to understand what happened with this lesion. You see the uh, action of the upper part of the trapezius is lacking. This is a typical appearance of the shoulder, which is turned uh, forwards and the action of the trapezius and the, the upper part of the scapula is lacking and is not able to turn backwards as you see in the arrow. So also learn to understand the differences between an accessory nerve palsy and a long thoracic nerve palsy. It is very important. And also to learn secondary surgery. For the zero shoulder is a big problem. And learn to do the trapezius transfer according to SA. This is the technique. There are books, there are papers. I can send you papers if you want. Uh, it is not an easy procedure. Dr. Basso, at the very first case, was very good in performing it. And uh, uh, you must, you must uh, be in possession of the orthopedic technique. You need the, uh, the key wire you put and then the, the, shroud, the, the, the screw into a, very, a, a more distal part of the bone. And uh, then you may have, for a shoulder zero, a very good result. This was a late case operated elsewhere uh, without result of the upper plexus, as happens because with very fantastic and personal technique, uh, the surgeon did a C3 and C4 to C5 and C6. I don't know whether he read this technique, but sometimes there are people uh, uh, waking from the bed in the morning and try to attend to surgery because uh, the results are coming after two years, so they think they can do everything, they can dare everything without criteria. So uh, we operated this patient, we didn't get any shoulder, but with the, you see, complete atrophy of deltoid, but you see with the SAR transfer, the result is not bad, I should say. It needs re-education, but for a shoulder zero, completely flail arm, this is a good result. If you don't know, and if you don't want, want to know some orthopedic technique, you can't get this. And ask an orthopedic, he can tell you, I don't dare, are you sure? And, and then what happens if the screws uh, lose? So it is better to do by yourself. This is my opinion. Uh, well, uh, ordinarily in, in the face of all the people I speak of collaboration, but when I put off the light, I think, that who is doing by, by himself is doing better. Then know what happens when I put a plate, because the plate in this case can be put by the last surgeon at the one o'clock in the uh, after, uh, afternoon when the level of the sugar is very low. And then also the intelligence comes low. So you can put the screw on the radial nerve. So try to learn what happens. If you have a repair of the pelvis, uh, sometimes this is a difficult technique. I don't put the blame on the orthopedic because unfortunately, it was not under the periosteum and was uh, screwed on the femoral nerve. And this, so we had to do, uh, was not to remove the whole implant, but just to cut it and free the femoral nerve. Look at this femoral nerve. At the microscope, we saw one third of the fascicle still sound. Uh, we, we were thinking putting a graft. So I insisted because one third is enough. One third is what we probably will get with a very good grafting of the complete section. And this patient recovered perfectly also with this femoral nerve. Here, know what happens. Radial nerve palsy after the insertion of a blocked nail. After this insertion, immediate radial nerve palsy. What can be happen? The orthopedic says, I've done nothing. There is a nail. And I ask it in, where did you put the screw? Oh, it's not possible. It's not possible. The screw cannot cut the radial nerve. Look at the radial nerve, exactly with the screw on the radial nerve. So you have to know that in a nail, in a, in a pin nail, then you have to add the screw 
and someone can add a screw in a not proper way. If you know this technique, if you have seen it at least once, you can imagine what is happening. Then learn to do the secondary thing, surgery, because if the patient does not recover, you cannot abandon him or her. So learn is not difficult. You have to learn the principles of anatomy, have a good book, to learn all the experiences during the polio period that were the flourishing uh, uh, period with the technique of secondary transfer and uh, do this, uh, try to think, uh, study, look at the uh, papers, but they are all papers, but you can find it. And then do, because the results are very rewarding. Look at this radial nerve this irreparable because the intramuscular branches were damaged. But look at the result. Again, this is a tendon transfer with irreparable nerve palsy and ulnar nerve entrapment. Look at the hand. I challenge you to say that here there was a radial irreparable radial nerve palsy. This is a particularly happy case, but can be reached. So if you know that this result can be reached, you are forced to perform more and more also of this, even if it's not really nice. I prefer to clip an aneurysm, it's more uh, amusing, but you have to do this. It is part of your job. Then another thing, if you have this case, uh, uh, damage of the dorsiflexion by hip replacement, you have to learn to do a simple tibialis transfer and try also to preserve with this device the foot at 90 degrees during the night because you uh, rebalance the extensor and flexor muscle and you can get good result. But if you don't, know that with a good tendon transfer, look what happens. Sorry for the... The tendon transfer after a hip replacement practically normal. The patient was happy, recovered a little bit of the extensor of the toes, but look. Another case, damage of the common peroneal nerve. Sometimes this is irreparable, is cut, or you put a graft, but with a graft, this is 20 centimeter. You cannot be sure that you have the result, so you add a tendon transfer. Tibialis transfer, look, look the result. These are very with the dislocation of the knee, but you have a good to excellent result. The patient can still, he can walk, sometimes run, and sometimes also play soccer. It's worth learning. If you don't learn, you leave the patient with the foot wrong. He will never find probably an orthopedic willing to take care of this case. Triceps muscle function is very important. Try to study, uh, like, in, looking, like in this case of old obstetrical palsy, try to do all your effort because the triceps, in my experience, cannot be replaced by tendon transfer. So enhance physical therapy because many patients without a triceps don't know to have at least an M2 which if they exert are able to gain a good triceps. This is worth explaining to them because this lady th was thinking to have no triceps function in life she doesn't use, but the secondary surgery is not possible. Then in obstetrical palsy, this is another big, uh, big issue. Uh, try to learn what happens when the shoulder develops in the wrong way learn to treat the internal contractor. I don't want to stay here much time, but there is a complete disarrangement of the joint. And then you have to learn the anterior approach, what is, uh, how is made the joint? How can you do a subscapularis release from anterior and from posterior? How to cut the glenohumeral ligament to do a coracoidectomy? They are gesture can be very, very good for the patient. Look at this case. This case is uh, before surgery uh, with the internal contracture. And this case it asked after surgery. Look how the result is different with a very simple orthopedic gesture. Again, 
Uh, this is a subluxation. I can you show some subluxations. I don't want to stay much time. Of course, we don't have time. We have a little bit to run. Also to look, to hear what Mariano has to say. But uh, this is another complication. Uh, the uh, pronation, the, uh, the um, supination deformity. Try to learn a radial osteotomy. What is the problem in doing is cutting it's like cutting a small piece of bread. I mean, it's really, there is no, no fear. You must not have fear of this. Uh, it can change the way to have the hand uh, come from a beggar hand to a good pronated hand. Look at this case. And it is a very simple gesture, nothing particular. Uh, look what can happen if you don't place a good surgery on the shoulder. A very bad result on the shoulder. Look at that lady, young lady. And look what happened if you have a good così, surgery così. of the, the shoulder. Yeah. 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 Sorry for, look, look the result of this one. Look, they can be almost normal and you have and the surgery on the nerve is the same, accessory to suprascapula. So it is worth doing, having in your armamentarium all the possibilities to help this patient and add and add more and more good assets to their results, which can be good, but you can uh, set them better with a good surgery. Okay, thank you very much for attention. <laughs> Thank you, Stefano, for this uh, uh, excellent presentation. Now I would like to invite uh, uh, our uh, honorary member, honorary member of uh, ENS section for peripheral neurosurgery, my uh, uh, very close, our very close friend uh, and uh, expert in the brachial plexus surgery. Uh, previous chairman of the uh, World Committee for Peripheral Neurosurgery, World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, and Chief of the Department of uh, Neurosurgery in uh, Buenos Aires. Mariano, please. Keep Thank on you, rolling. Lucas. Keep on rolling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, also for the nice invitation. And uh, I'm glad to be here with you all. Well, uh, when Stefano asked me to speak about this syndrome of the Orphelin, and after Googling Orphelin, uh, I had to uh, answer this question. How did I overcome not to be a renowned vascular or skull-based surgeon? Which is, in fact, a very easy to answer uh, question, because I would never be, uh, have been a renowned vascular or skull-based surgeon. So it's... Uh, an easy question, but let me put the, the, the answer in another way. Is perineal, perineal surger, uh, nerve surgery as important as clipping an aneurysm or resecting a brain tumor? I remember many years ago, I, I was uh, uh, clipping an arterial communicating artery aneurysm uh, in a young girl who had no neurological deficit. So I was, uh, I was stressed about the, about the evolution of the patient. Fortunately, everything went well. Everything was okay. She was perfect. But anyway, after the surgery, I start to think to myself, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? To disactivate bombs like aneurysm? Do I enjoy this type of surgery or not? Of course, this is a very personal uh, question and it does admit as many answers as people uh, perform this question. So I won't uh, speak about uh, generality, I will speak about uh, me myself. I, I say no, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to thank my chief of resident to send me this uh, aneurysm clipping uh, who, who did last week. So ego and neurosurgeons, this is a very interesting thing to speak about because uh, uh, as you know, people who decide to become a neurosurgeon usually uh, 
we have a big ego. And uh, a big ego means that we, uh, when we try to uh, focus on someone, for example, we don't, uh, we will focus on a very high uh, level uh, uh, people, for example, Gassi Yasri. So every one of us, uh, when we start neurosurgery, wants to become Yasri. Uh, of course, only Yasri could get there. So sometimes, your ego is, is not a friend. Maybe you are a slave of your ego. So a, a good strategy is to get away or get rid of uh, this type of influence and do what you really want to do. So neurosurgeons do not need to be, uh, who operate peripheral nerve surgery are not less than other neurosurgeons. Let me state this clearly, nerve surgery improves very importantly, the quality of life of our patients. So do nerve surgery. This is the main uh, message of my talk. So my objective during this, don't worry, very short talk, is to combine, to combine uh, those who are not, uh, that nerve surgery is worth enough to be done by neurosurgeons, just because results are good, which is a very good reason. For example, just to show you some examples, brachial plexus surgery, you have a C5, C6 injury, we already talked about that, and you see on the, on the left, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we'll take it out, uh, uh, a C5, an upper uh, trunk lesion with uh, no uh, shoulder motion, no elbow flexion, and the result in the, uh, in the, post, in the right, on the right, uh, the postoperative was very good. So this is a typical, result after an upper trunk recovery. You can either do nerve transfers as we did in this patient, but also raft transfer. This is uh, not important. The important thing is that we can get good results. And what about complete injuries, 5T1? Well, this is a complete tragedy for the patient. As we know, no hand, no elbow, no shoulder, pain, the arm is internally rotated. This is a complete tragedy. So I can show you a lot of videos showing good results of uh, some patients waving their upper limbs. And uh, this is good, of course. This is rewarding, of course. But uh, you should ask not to move, like in the, in the left video, not to move the, the, the limbs, but you should ask the patient, what do you do in your uh, daily life? Or how did the surgery improve your uh, daily life? So a common example is by manual handling of uh, a box, for example, as you can see here. This is a very, very important improvement. If you start from a complete paralyzed uh, upper limb and you can get into there. This is another Example I want to share with you, this is a very simple surgery in terms of uh, decision. It's an intercostal to muscular It's just that, for elbow flexion. Then we, with our orthopedics, we did a shoulder arthrodesis and a right arthrodesis. So two arthrodesis, one nerve transfer, and this is the preliminary result. But if you see the same patient, three years after the surgery, you can see that he's able to do many things. So as I said, you impact completely the quality of life of your patients. He can hold something, he can use the paralyzed limb as an accessory limb, even to hold a wallet to take out a document or whatever. Here, look at on the left. This is a proof that peripheral nerve surgery prevents COVID infection. This is demonstrated with this video. So a very normal or usual act that we do now during this pandemic, is not so easy to, do, to be done in a brachial plexus patient. And you see how he can do it only with one nerve transfer and two orthopedic surgeries. Also putting, a, holding a, a face mask is also 
another thing that can contribute very importantly to the quality of life of our patients. More movements here on the left, opening a bag, holding things, doing another type of my manual things. So you can really impact the life, the life of your patients. This is a, a, a conference on a control, controversies. And uh, I'm very optimistic, of course. And uh, I want to share with you or with those who are not so familiarized with this type of surgery, because it is very important that uh, someone gets into this uh, surgery. Facial palsy, just to finish. Stefano did a wonderful job showing many, many uh, ways to re the facial nerve. He published a lot on that. Uh, this is one of his um, technique, Sawamura of, of ferraresis technique, if you want to call it. And this is pre-op and on the other side, post-op, good result, good recovery, another type of injury, another type of, of solution, another patient, again, pre-op on the left, post-op on the right, pre-op on the left and post-op on the right. Of course, I'm not specially skilled talent is overrated. All the results that you saw are fully reproducible in any experienced peripheral nerve center by any well-trained peripheral nerve surgeon. You have to train. Of course, this is not a so easy surgery. And besides, you are not so accustomed to uh, arm anatomy or leg anatomy or even uh, uh, abdominal anatomy or whatever. So you have to kind of start again from the very beginning. But which are the advantages we as neurosurgeons have? And I want to also state this clear, very clearly. I have many friends uh, uh, doing uh, orthopedic surgery and hand surgery and plastic surgery who do very, very, very absolutely nice job repairing nerves and they contribute a lot to the progress of this field. But anyway, which are our advantages as neurosurgeons? We know how to handle nervous tissue. We are accustomed to handle uh, uh, the brain, spine. We born with a microscope in our hands. A microsurgical training is, starts from the beginning in our residency program in general, and we perfectly know how to make a neurological physical examination. Of course, the cons is that we like mainly orthopedic and plastic knowledge. So we have to get into that knowledge year by year, the once you get more into this field, you get to know, as Stefano just shown us very nicely, this kind of knowledge. So our approach is multidisciplinary. We uh, work with our orthopedic surgeon, with our, our physiotherapist, with our ultrasonographist. We are a lot working all together in uh, our uh, university hospital uh, in Buenos Aires. So in conclusion, nerve surgery improves very importantly the quality of life of our patients. Please do nerve surgery. From Buenos Aires, from Buenos Aires Argentina, I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Mariano, for your uh, exciting presentation, like always. Uh, uh, we are uh, now closing to our uh, Final stage, uh, questions and comments uh, will be discussed uh, at the end of all presentations. So I would kind of like to ask uh, uh, Professor Shimon Rokin the, from Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, to give us a uh, lecture on clinical aspects of ballistic peripheral nerve injuries, gunshot versus shrapnel injuries. Please, Shimon. Dear colleagues, the subject of this lecture is the clinical aspect of ballistic peripheral nerve injury, comparison between gunshot and shrapnel injuries. Patients with ballistic injuries of peripheral nerve often fail to display a significant spontaneous return of motor and sensory function and require surgery for restoration of this function and relief of neuropathic pain. 
is a diagnosis location of the ballistic injury. MRI and CT scan image surface is not sufficient. This is example. This is a gray. Shimon, please uh, uh, share your screen. Share your screen. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, on the beginning of, uh, of uh, the webinar, just uh, share your screen, please. It's yeah. okay now? Now it's okay. Uh, just to see, yes, now start your presentation and that's it. Okay. For diagnostic localization of the ballistic injury, MRI and CT scan is not sufficient. This is example. This is X-ray with bullet. Many artifacts we found in the CT scan and MRI. From another hand, uh, play, play, uh... from, another, from another hand, ultrasound observation shows clear picture of a nerve injury. This is example of intraneural direct injury, this fragment into the nerve. But it's not only injury of the nerve. Response for this area, significant inflammation reaction surrounding the nerve, and final results of this inflammation is heart scar tissue formation. This is another example of blast injury of the median nerve. Possible to see thicken fascicles after blast injury. And this is case of nerve transaction. It's clear possible to see an ultrasound distal and proximal part and hematoma formation between both parts of the nerve. This is another example of indirect nerve compression of the fragment and results of this incompression is granulation tissue surrounding the fragment with pressure on the nerve. In cases of complete peripheral nerve injury, unfortunately, see in most of the cases with severe gunshot or shrapnel injuries, uh, indication for nerve repair is uh, like general, this intraneural sky and continuum, post-traumatic neuroma, recooptation of the transected nerve requires traction of the proximal and distal parts, and of course, massive loss defect of the nerve. Gold standard is the uh, 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 using of a sensory, in most of the cases, sural nerve for nerve reconnection. Generally, it's from two to five nerve graphs, and they also uh, recommended to use uh, nine or ten zero switches. As a correlation between land graphs and the functional recovery is depend from length of the graph. If length of the graft until two centimeters, 80% of the patient shows three or more than three muscle power in his function. If the length of the graft from two to five centimeters, 78% of the patient shows positive results from three to more than three uh, muscle power grade. If between five to 10 centimeters, it starts to decrease. 62% of the patient shows, imp shows improvement, but if there's more than 10%, only 25% of the patient shows improvement. This is example of a, a 10 centimeter nerve graph of the sciatic nerve between proximal and distal parts. And also it's five or seven graphs, but in most of the cases, results is not so good. The so nerve recovery depends on the length of the graph. This is the graph present a response of different nerves for nerve reconstruction procedure. This is upper extremity nerves. The best results we receive in radial and accessory nerve. It means muscle grade three or more. The median nerve shows the results in most of the cases state we see three or less in muscle power and ulnar nerve also shows good results. In low extremity, the best results we found in tibial nerve, 
a strong, strong motor nerve is good response. And also tibial portion of the sciatic nerve shows good response. Blue color, this muscle power three or more. And the orange color, this muscle power less than three. The uh, peroneal nerve, uh, only 50% of the patient shows improvement after nerve graft and similar results we receive in sciatic nerve portion of the peroneal nerve. Timing of the recovery. Timing of recovery, first of all, neurosurgeon must be very patient because it's long-term process. This is same patient, but different timing of investigation. This is investigation was done after nerve uh, graft grafting procedure in less than two years after surgery. 64% of the patient saw muscle grade three or more. But if you continue to follow up this patient after two years, it's possible to happen also in three and four years after surgery, is increased to 73%. It's mean nest recovery, a long-term process, and very important physiotherapy, swim, and in, in, in any kind of a sport activity during this period. The purpose of this part of presentation a comparison of two different types of ballistic peripheral nerve injury, gunshot versus shrapnel, on basis of the common and dissimilar prognostic factor, comparison of surgical approach, and the role of microsurgical intervention for regaining of functional activity and prevention of neuropathic pain. 50% of the shrapnel victims it was found intraneural foreign bodies. 50% of the patients suffer from intraneural uh, injury from fr small fragments. In gunshot wound, only 4% of the patients have, uh, uh, have uh, intraneural uh, injury into the uh, nerve. Small uh, problem today, in, especially in small uh, metallic fragment is shrapnel injury because it's, until now, most of the centers are uh, considered intern and left in situ and treated conservative and prophylactic antibiotics and pain treatment. However, this was shown to be gradually encased in fibrous tissue, suggesting that inflammatory reaction to fragments left in soft tissue can develop even years after the injury. This is example. Small fragment, one millimeter diameter. That's all, into the nerve. Response for this small fragment, huge neuroma, traumatic, post-traumatic neuroma, and the, this is surgery of this patient, the small fragments, seven or eight nerve grafts was done to remove of this huge post-traumatic neuroma. We investigate surgical techniques in the gunshot wound and shrapnel injuries. Most of the cases, uh, orange color is gunshot, blue color is shrapnel injuries patients. Most of the patients underwent neurolysis in both group. And nerve group and nerve graft was done 26 and 90% in, uh, in uh, gunshot and the uh, and, uh, shrapnel injury. Average length of the nerve graft in gunshot wound, this is example, was six centimeters. Average length of nerve graft in shrapnel injuries was 4.2 centimeters. We investigate response to the surgery, nevrolysis and nerve graft. In group of nevrolysis, patient who was operated, they have muscle power from zero to less than three. And after nevrolysis, we receive significant improvement in motor, in muscle power in gunshot wound. Unfortunately, in shrapnel injury after neurolysis, only 57% shows improvement. If you compare neuropathic pain before surgery and after surgery in both groups of the patient, we found before surgery, in gunshot wound, 52% of the patient suffered was more than five, and 92% of the shrapnel injured patients suffered from severe neuropathic pain, was more than five. After surgery, was significant decrease of uh, neuropathic pain in gunshot wound, but in shrapnel injury, 58% to continue to suffer from severe neuropathic pain. It's been was more than five. In nerve grafts, in uh, nerve grafts shows for muscle power recovery is uh, uh, 
similar results, 72% gunshot, 83% in, uh, in shock nail injuries. And the surprising finding was response to the neuropathic pain. Was significant response in neuropathic pain is both group gunshot wounds and shock nail injuries. In conclusion, microsurgical intervention can relieve neuropathic pain and restore motor function in ballistic peripheral nerve injuries. The surgical outcome of shrapnel peripheral nerve injury is significantly worse with respect to neuropathic pain. So it could be related to local inflammatory factors, secondly to the more diffuse damage of blast injury and retained foreign particles with or near the injured nerve frequently found after shrapnel injury. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shimon, for sharing us uh, your uh, great experience in ballistic injuries. Uh, uh, this is uh, very, very valuable to all of them who do not have the opportunity for all these uh, uh, cases. Uh, before we answer some questions, um, I would like to, instead of conclusion, uh, say uh, uh, some words uh, about uh, about uh, this um, situation uh, what we are talking about this is um, our uh, very first I would say inaugurational webinar uh, starting with the uh, series of ENS educational webinars. It is my great privilege that we have um, opportunity to create and organize uh, very easily and very, very uh, nicely and softly this webinar, especially because of the, because the section of the ENS section for peripheral nerve surgery is the youngest section within the European Association of Neurological Surgeons, but very active and proactive and uh, just a few slides and few comments about uh, all these uh, uh, aspects what we are talking about uh, as a peripheral nerve still a neurosurgical practice top 10 reasons to do peripheral nerve surgery you heard a lot but i will summarize something like uh, some some of uh, them despite the, this uh, biological uh, challenge various opportunity that nerves are regenerating and repair is possible. And uh, we are also uh, always asking why results are not better and the regeneration is slow, suffering hazards, all nerve injuries are chronic, renovation is misdirected, not specific and imprecise. We can achieve a nice result. So we are neurosurgeons. Uh, peripheral nerve surgery is uh, uh, dealing with uh, disorders of peripheral nerve system. And peripheral nervous system is an essential part of nervous system. Other part is central nervous system. And uh, who is doing best and uh, with a uh, big feeling, neurosurgeons. Knowledge of neuroscience is also very important for the understanding and um, treating of this uh, patient uh, with uh, peripheral nerve system disorders, especially knowledge of the anatomy. Handling nervous tissue is uh, something that uh, we heard from Mariano, we heard from all of us, but uh, uh, neurosurgeons know how to handle nervous tissue. And who should handle your nerves? Orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeon, plastic surgeon, or neurosurgeon. So this is uh, some kind of common surgery uh, for uh, many microsurgeons who are, have microsurgical skills, but as uh, Mariano said, we are always sharing this kind of uh, enthusiasm and ideas all over the world as uh, keep on rolling like rolling stones that neurosurgeons are born with microscopes in their hands and no other surgeons are trained in microsurgery during their initial training in residency, such as neurosurgeons. Uh, education and research is an essential part of uh, everyday practice in uh, peripheral nerve surgery. So we are now uh, starting uh, expanding the horizon in education uh, within the peripheral nerve surgery, within our uh, peripheral nerve surgery group regarding uh, theoretical 
education so far, but I am also very eager to start with, uh, again, practical uh, uh, hands-on courses, cadaver courses, fellowships, uh, what we are already established uh, before the corona crisis, COVID outbreak. We are publishing our research uh, and uh, we also discussed that uh, small series in the rare patients are significant and uh, this uh, will consider papers for peripheral surgery. So surgery due to the insufficiency will consider small series of, of a treatment variations of, for peripheral nerve surgeries, injuries and diseases. Uh, learning curve is steep from basic through advanced to the complex uh, surgical procedures. As we explained many times, uh, this is one of our books and uh, now and then another one regarding um, <clears throat> nerve. Three tumors are uh, appearing on the scene. As you can see, these are the complex uh, structures, anatomical structures where the, all this integration of all these knowledge and skills and everything is uh, necessary. Of course, we have to follow innovations and uh, to be up to date and follow modern trends. So robotic augmenting and virtual reality, bionic reconstructions, artifi artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, cloud database are also part of our everyday practice. Results are good and uh, depending of course of type of the lesion, type of the timing of surgery, type of the nerve and uh, of course physical therapy, but generally res results are good. Patience is important. Most neurosurgeons are not satisfied with the wait for the results. It may take up to one or two years to see the result of your work. And uh, some of our examples, one of your example is uh, uh, C5 grafting uh, to the musculocutaneous and axillary nerve uh, to the upper brachial plexus palsy with uh, associated uh, injuries of uh, uh, fracture of the clavicle and uh, vascular elements, uh, subclavian vein, and this is something what is nice. Complications are uh, present, but rare, then they can be, there can be, uh, or there can be occurred during the course of peripheral nerve surgery, and they are very rare in our hands. Uh, direct intraoperative complications are extremely rare, uh, never occur in experience of specialist peripheral treatments. Surgery-related complications are more surgeon-related, and overlapping with iatrogenic peripheral nerve injuries. And this is uh, also gives us a comprehensive overview in many of our reports. Some of the cases that we mentioned as uh, so complications related to the peripheral nerves, as you can see. Uh, new concepts, cutting your nerve, change your brain, and uh, uh, brain plasticity is also important for our uh, final results and functional outcome, also in, as a quantum entalgement. But our main goal is quality of life. We do help our patient in uh, improving their quality of life. And that's the most important reason for our activities. Uh, not many articles are published. Uh, we should uh, publish many more. And the possibilities for doing peripheral surgery are many in the public and private hospital. But the environment uh, should be created by the, by the peripheral nerve surgeon, including all aspects of uh, organization of practice. So multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity are already mentioned many times. And uh, this is something we, <coughs> which we <coughs> are doing all the time. And uh, long, not so long ago, we discussed about uh, this situation like a crisis versus opportunity. Crisis in terms of uh, what should we do with the peripheral nerve surgery? Uh, this peripheral nerve surgery will be completely abandoned by neurosurgeons or not. Then a small group of devoted people, who many of them are here, like veterans, like Stefano, Shibon, Mariano, myself, etc. And uh, now with great pleasure, I have to say that today we have joined many younger people to, uh, make this situation crisis versus opportunity to the opportunity and the opportunity for change and evolution, research and innovation, quality of life and the patient satisfaction, of course, to, and to have also some of 
balance work and uh, and uh, our service and our private life. So keep calm and the raise awareness and the love of brachial plexus surgery. Do you saw these photos? And uh, this is my family. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, uh, I would like to uh, come to the final stage of our uh, final phase of our webinar to go through all these uh, questions that we received today. So we have um, uh, questions with uh, you that you can see uh, how long from Taras Petri, also from Ukraine, again from Ukraine, how long you recommending to wait before facial nerve neur neurotization and which donors you are using a patient after acoustic neuroma surgery or after infection virus facial plexopathy? Should, should I answer? You see the you see the this uh, chat I see I think so you can you can uh, also uh, check the, the question once again so please uh, uh, this is a question from Taras Petriv how yes. long you yeah 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 uh, I think uh, if you are speaking about spontaneous uh, facial palsy which is not the same of course than uh, a iatrogenic uh, nerve injury. Uh, that we usually see. Uh, <laughs> spontaneous palsy usually recovers in a very hard percentage of cases. So uh, whatever deficit the patient has, the wisest decision, in my view, is to wait. How long do you wait? Well, we saw that uh, the results of uh, nerve transfers for facial palsy, palsy starts to go down after one year and definitely are very low, more than two years after the course. So the right thing is given the fact that spontaneous recovery is the rule and not the exception, I would wait at least one year. Another comment? It's not uh, uh, Milan Mladanowski from uh, Macedonia, uh, again, sorry for the incomplete question. My aim was that he raised the question, what is the percent of nerve recovery after nerve trauma surgery in all departments you present? Uh, now, sorry for the incomplete question. My aim was the injury of the arm and the injury of the radial median or other median or one nerve injury in the ante brachium region in forearm. Also very, very, I would say, uh, wide question. Yes. But if you see the question, you can, you can read it. Again, he is the continuity, uh, Milan Madanowski said, the nerve is cut by some object knife and we need to suture it. Uh, I, I suppose that he thinks about uh, uh, clear, clear cut injuries or, or uh, sharp injuries. Still, the question is not so very well defined. But anyhow, any comment would be uh, appreciated. So um, I have to agree to the answer that was given before, that it does depend on the nerve. I think the radial nerve easily re even um, if it's directly cut. Um, median nerve is also fine, um, depending um, on the proximity, if it's very distal or if it's very proximal. Um, I have to admit that I do have troubles with the ulnar nerve. Um, if I do have a direct suture, sometimes re um, is missing and then you have to think about a transfer and a secondary option. I don't know what the experience from the other panelists is. Any other comment? I can, I cannot see any, any more questions here. Also in the chat, uh, it appears in some moment that, that there was some question from Ketan Desai, but I cannot find here now. But uh, generally, if there are any more questions, you can uh, shoot now until we approach to the, our 
final comments and conclusion regarding the webinar. So I'm... Uh, it is the first raising for the questions before the closing the webinar. Ketan Desai is, Ketan, hello, how are you? He's, uh, he's asking, what is the time limit uh, you all would consider for primary nerve repair surgery in sciatic, that peroneal nerve injuries? Yes, that's it, that's it. That's what I was looking for. Okay, any comments? If you have problem with the motor, is better to not to overcome one and a half. If you need to recover sensation, it's still it is worth doing. So it depends in a full sciatic nerve injury, uh, what you want. I mean, full sciatic nerve. In peroneal nerve injuries, it is questionable because already uh, if it is not a clean cut by a glass, uh, the results of nerve repair in peroneal nerve as poor. Uh, if it is a glass or a neat injury, you can repair and try even one year after. Otherwise, it is better to go to a tendon transfer. Uh, there is a, there is also another comment, uh, question from, uh, from Ketan. What is the time limit you all would consider you all would consider for primary nerve repair surgery in sciatic or peroneal nerve injuries? Okay, I'll answer. Yeah, and another one is uh, what is the time limit? You you answered also that. What is the time limit uh, you all would consider for? That's, that's the same question, practically. Yeah. Okay. Any other comment question? I cannot see any more questions in a question and answer chat, and uh, I'm not seeing also in a, a regular chat. So a second raising for the comments and question before the conclusion of the webinar regarding peripheral nerve surgery pathology. If not, Let's go to the conclusions, to the final comments. Stefano, please. Uh, yes, um, I think this experiment uh, has gone very well. And I hope we can uh, make some of this webinar again. Uh, I would, uh, I would um, prefer for the next webinar to have a specific issue where we can decide what to do. For instance, malignant nerve tumors. So we have to uh, go through completely and have the contribution also from the, um, from the public because uh, no one has the, uh, the exact solution for this terrible uh, pathology. So, or you can ask for uh, what is the better way to, to get the recovery of the deltoid or whatever you want, whatever the proposal by our chat. We could also make a chat. You, you could be the administrator of a WhatsApp chat uh, with, with the same uh, peripheral nerve uh, group. So any people who wants to add just uh, adds to the chat then we can grow and uh, organize better future webinars. Uh, this, uh, this comment uh, is very valuable. And uh, uh, there is uh, on the ENS website, um, uh, one page uh, related to the peripheral nerve surgery section, ENS section for peripheral nerve surgery. Also, th th there can be uh, any kind of uh, comments and ideas, suggestions should be also uh, created on this uh, website, on the NINAS website. They, everybody can write to everybody of us and uh, 
do anything uh, what is uh, can be some additional contribution for uh, let's say uh, improving the quality of uh, our service, uh, quality of our activities, uh, quality of the webinars. But uh, so far, this is, a, let's say, inaugurational webinar, first one, and uh, to introduce the topic, to include the topic, to expand the horizons, to do create uh, new interest for the, for the peripheral nerve surgery for us, who we are doing this, and we know each other very well. Uh, we can easily create any kind of uh, webinar in uh, any kind of topic uh, related to the peripheral nerve surgery, mm, trauma, injuries, uh, tumors, entrapment syndromes, uh, any other special sub topic or something like that. But generally speaking, uh, as a series of webinars created by ENS, this is ENS webinar, and I'm very proud that uh, we are all together here participating uh, as ENS, uh, members of ENS uh, section for peripheral nerve surgery, uh, creating uh, on the first yes, I, I want the webinar under the auspices of ENS, of course. No, no, uh, no, no, this is, this is uh, not under the auspices. This is ENS webinar. This is yes, not the ENS webinar. I want to do more, but always yeah. under the auspices of EANS. So ENS is uh, give us uh, support uh, in uh, any kind of electricity. I think, I think we should continue. So I thank you all uh, for uh, your time and your uh, ideas, energy, participation. I'm very glad to see all of you in a very good shape and uh, very con condition. I hope that participants and our followers or who all watch us uh, via YouTube or uh, others channels are uh, satisfied. We are open for any kind of suggestions and comments for uh, everything. So like Mariano and I used to say, keep on rolling. We have to roll on as well to do uh, everything, our, our activities. And Mariano and I used to say, keep on rolling. We yeah. have to as well to do everything. Uh, yes. Any other who would like to give us any kind of comment of panelists to share their, their uh, let's say, impressions uh, regarding the webinar? I just want to congratulate Stefano and uh, especially uh, Lucas to join this uh, for all together and all the panelists for the participation. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Thank you all. Thank so you. Well. Any other? This was excellent. It was really excellent and successful. I believe the participants received many additional knowledge from each of us. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it, will, it will be very important to continue. Thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you very much, Stefano, for well organized the webinar. Very well organized. Thank you, Shimon. Ladies. Thank you, Stefano and Lucas. Um, you made me curious. So um, when we start um, with, the, with the topics, I think this is a very good idea to put some subtopics in. And Stefano was uh, already uh, talking about the thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, and I would be very, very, very um, excited if there would be a possibility to talk about this syndrome because this is a huge, thing of discussion and um, we have to face people from vascular surgery um, who dominate this field um, in the literature and also in, in, in my local community so I would love um, to hear your experience on that as I think this is a very complex syndrome and we do have a community with experienced surgeons so I would suggest to um, have a webinar on thoracic outlet syndrome. We can discuss with you as to make a, to a series of webinar within the PNS section. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yes, the issue is very interesting, of course, and uh, I'm favorable. Okay. Okay. Natalia, Elisabetta, all, all is good. Yes. Uh, well, it was my pleasure to participate in this webinar. The topic uh, is really interesting and 
provocative, as was already said. And yeah, I, I'm also interested in uh, maybe next webinars, but I believe we will finally finish this uh, coronavirus uh, <laughs> epidemic and probably will meet in already live conferences. Uh, and but thoracic outlet syndrome is, is really interesting and I know that uh, Professor Ferrezi has really uh, large experience in this so yeah uh, I joined to this idea yeah thank you to everybody it was really interesting thank you Natalia Natalia would say good night because it is very late now in Russia I think it's one o'clock yeah, it's one. It's one a.m. Yeah, that's true. It's better. Uh, well, I find uh, that this uh, webinar was very interesting, and uh, it will be the beginning of an interesting project that we can uh, uh, start to all together. So I think this is uh, a very interesting meeting, and thank you to Lucas and Dr. Ferraresi for the the invitation. Thank you very much. Last but not least. Gentlemen, young gentlemen, Vicenzo and Pravin, any any comments? Uh, thank, thank you very much, everybody. It was really educational, and uh, uh, this uh, three hours uh, webinar was very very fruitful, I think. And I think a huge part of peripheral nerve surgery is still hidden, uh, mainly in our part where the technology is lacking. So I think we have to explore more and more scope of uh, the peripheral surgery. We should encourage the young people. Uh, to take over the peripheral nursery as their specialty and definitely uh, I will look uh, forward to have next uh, webinar in different parts, uh, different aspects of peripheral uh, nerve surgery in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm also delighted uh, for this opportunity and that um, even if the situation doesn't consent us to meet in person, that we can also at least share our opinion and our your knowledge uh, to everyone, to everybody in this in this way. I totally agree. The thoracic artery syndrome is a great topic to discuss. Usually misdiagnosed or misunderstood. So I'm looking forward to it. So I think we uh, established a new topic for the webinar: thoracic artery <laughs> syndrome, pros and cons. So that's it. That's fine. Let's uh, find the. the the time in the timetable of the ENS webinars for the for the next webinar of ENS peripheral nurse surgery section, and uh, that's it. I thank you all for your uh, participation and contribution. I thank uh, ENS uh, office for this uh, great support and the ENS board for giving us uh, opportunity to create this uh, webinar. Uh, Annie, right on time. Uh, we need the one uh, screenshot all together. Uh, put uh, your smile on your face, your ni nice position, just to have a to have a nice uh, screenshot all together. Can we do it, Annie? Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, it's done. Thank you. Uh, you you will send us, I, I think, via email the, this photo. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Thank you so uh, last but not least, um, you know that uh, this year all meetings uh, and congresses uh, in the world are uh, cancelled, postponed uh, or transformed in uh, uh, virtual meetings. Uh, this year uh, in, we should all meet in Belgrade in, uh, in October. 18 to 22nd, but uh, due to the very well known reasons, this will not be possible this year. Uh, on the very same date, uh, there will be ENS uh, educational uh, meeting uh, beyond the borders uh, virtual meeting, which uh, I cordially invite you on uh, behalf of uh, all the ENS colleagues and uh, and uh, ENS board and. Uh, I have uh, good news. ENS Congress in Belgrade will be in 2022, live and kicking. So we postponed the Belgrade for 2022, and uh, it will be very nice to have you all. Uh, everything what was prepared for uh, 2020 will be improved and even better 
for 2022. So that's it for, for tonight. Now uh, it would be all, folks. So my pleasure. We can uh, say goodbye to all our participants and uh, to everybody. And all the best to your families and uh, keep in touch, keep enrolling and all the best. Annie, you are closing the meeting, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.